Hello and welcome to Fantastic Tones for Human Bones. In this podcast, Mark Prascucci Clifford and myself, Robert Woods Ledoux, discuss music that we find inspiring and hold interviews with musicians discussing their work and practice. In this episode, we talk with percussionist and educator Brian Potts. We discuss Brian's background, including his extensive stay at University of Miami and how he managed to get so involved with the music of Brazil. We focus on the album Written House by PRD Meisch and talk about the members of that band. Check out Written House by PRD Meisch on Ground Up Music. This is also available to stream on Apple or Spotify, but you can best support the releasing label by buying a download on their site. Check out Pandero Moderno at Groove Archie, the modern Pandero method as taught by Bernardo Aguiar and Brian Potts. You can support the podcast by subscribing to us on Patreon. Follow us on Twitter at Tones underscore four. Follow us on Instagram at FT4HB. We greatly appreciate any and all support. Thank you. Fantastic Tones for Human Bones. Welcome to Fantastic Tones for Human Bones. I'm one of your two hosts, Robert Woods Ledoux. My name is Mark Pescucci Clifford. And today with us, we have my good friend and percussion master, Brian Potts. Yes. Howdy, y'all. Hello, Dr. Brian Potts. Thank y'all, man. This is awesome. I'm super excited to be on here. Thank you very much for joining us. We we appreciate you and your time. Yes, very much. So, and it's, it's a little bit later on your end, right? You're in Miami. Yeah, but it's only, what, it's 8 o'clock here? It's not too terrible. This is like when the day should be getting started, yeah? Right. I'm fine with this. From, from what I've gathered from from uh, you'll, talking to friends. You'll get ready to go to the club there. after the interview here, right? Exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah. We've got, we've got a table waiting, bottle service, the whole thing. <laughs> VIP <Nice>. tonight, huh? <laughs> Every night, baby. Come on, we don't do anything less than that. Um. Uh, okay. So, um, this is a little hard for me cause I know you so well, but, um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's take it back to the beginning. Um, let's do it, baby. Um, <laughs> so born in Texas, born in Texas. I was born in Fort Worth. Oh, nice. Which, you know, being from Dallas and being raised in Dallas, I was kind of looked I didn't tell that many people I was born in Fort Worth. Now I'm, I'm able to say it freely, but growing up in <laughs> Dallas, he said, no, 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 I'm Dallas 100%. Never been to Fort Worth, you know? <laughs> I, As I, I have a nice I didn't zoo, know that's I, about it. About that drama, but that's interesting. <laughs> My experience in the Dallas-Fort Worth area has all been in Fort Worth, and that's oh, really? where like, a lot of the people that I'm familiar with are, are doing their work right now, whether fine artists or musicians or sound designers or whatever. There's... For, from what I understand, there's a pretty nice happening scene. I, I mean, they're they're surprisingly, like, far apart. I think, you know, like, they get thrown together because the airport's in the middle, and so everybody goes through there, you yeah. know? Yeah. But, like, you got to go, like, a good hour or so to get over there. And when I was a kid anyway, there wasn't much in between them. But now I'm sure it's all different. And to tell you the truth, I wouldn't know because I met Bob Ledoux about 20 years ago now yeah. when I moved yeah. to Miami. And, you know, I go back and I see folks, you know, I see my family and, you know, a few friends, but very limited when I go back. And, and in 20 years, that city has changed just so much, both of them. So yeah, I, I actually, I 100% believe it that, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, Denton, where UNT is, I think mm. there's another like really happening area up there. There's a lot of good stuff huh. in that part of the world now. Yeah. How close is Denton? I'm sure that the scene there is pretty ridiculous because of the school yeah. alone. Exactly, because of the school. It's around the same. I think it's like 45 minutes from Dallas, like north of where I grew up anyway, you know? So oh, okay. They're all kind of in this little cluster. And the thing about Would you s- Texas is uh, that there's no, like, there's no geography to bump up against, right? So all the suburbs and the cities, they just kind of spread out into each other. Yeah. You know? So I think by <laughs> now, like, Dallas and Fort Worth have engulfed Denton and all these other places, you know, like there's just a spread going just like up the there. So Dallas it's, it's Metroplex. Yeah, exactly. The Metroplex is a flexing right now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you have music, musical family members that... I do. Um, uh, when did you start... When do you 
when did you start getting into music or were you forced to play music or how did that happen for you? I mean, it was, it was, I guess it was kind of all of the above in a sense. I mean, I was into it from an early age because I was around it. Like both of my parents, as you know, Bob went to university of Miami, like us, they went to university of Miami back in the uh, late seventies mm. as music engineers. And, uh, so then they, they left Miami, they went up to New York. They both worked in studios up there for a couple of years. My dad got a job in Dallas and I showed up and then they stayed in Dallas, you know, but like that background of being around music never really left. And so they were always playing music in the house. They played piano, guitar around the house. Like it was always around. My uncle was a drummer who also went to UM as well too. Mm. I have a whole friggin' lineage of people from, uh, especially from my mom's side of the family that all went to university of Miami and most of them, whether, I mean, they were either in the music school or they were performing their musicians as well too. So, so you knew at an early so that, age that you had to yeah, get a doctorate from there. UM. <laughs> I, yeah, nobody told me that I had to do that. That was my own ill-advised idea. No, it's great. <laughs> but like, yeah. And I mean, I was around it all the time and, um, and there was never like, it was never weird for me to think about doing music as a profession, even though like my parents weren't actively doing it. My mom went off into working for a marketing firm. My, my dad did software engineering that they, they branched off for sure. But like the idea of music as a career was not foreign to me because mm -hmm. of them. <clears throat> and they were super supportive of all of me going to UM. They were super supportive of me being in high school band and, and junior high before that. That's really where I started playing percussion. You know, like most kids in Texas, it's in the marching band. Yeah, you were, I've, uh, from what I had heard uh, on your other interviews that I listened to, you were pretty involved in drumline. I, yeah, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to avoid in, in, in Dallas, you know, like that, mm -hmm. because there's football, so then there has to be a marching <laughs> band, and then there have to be kids <laughs> in that marching band, you know? So, like, they... <laughs> they fill those up pretty good. Like Duncanville High School, I think, had like 400 people marching at a time. Whoa. Like, it was crazy. These are massive, massive groups. And it's like it's the entry point for so many people to get sticks in their hands and to start doing things is is really through that, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so like while I had other interests at the time for sure, like the main driving force where I was getting all my lessons, where I was doing most of my performances, was through the band program, you yeah. know? You know, I used to march on a snare alongside Andrew McGuire in our high school citywide marching band way back in the day. Like, oh, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. I've known, I've known Andrew for many, many years. Uh, I, I had no I idea, didn't know man. That, That's actually. amazing, dude. Or did I know that? I don't, rem uh, I don't remember. I mean, you knew that we were friends I didn't, in Denver, yeah. but I don't think you knew that we marched. Yeah. Wow. So that was Denver, right? So you grew up there? Yep. Uh, very cool. That's hilarious. I just listened to a podcast that Andrew McGuire did speaking of Was it the listening to discussions podcasts. and percussion one? Yeah, that's the exact one with Damon. Yeah. Yeah. And uh and yeah, he brought up like his time during that sort of stuff. So I think well, like there's a lot of us who all kind of went through that. You know, you you did as well too. And it, and it's it's a it's the first place that you start to play in larger groups. It's the first place that you start to have to I don't know. Think about rehearsing and forms, and think about things a little bit more than just like I'm. I'm making noise. You know, I, like, yeah. I've never played in a marching band, but I've always been actually fascinated by the listening techniques that one has to develop when you're. It's pretty bonkers, like to 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 listen forward. I mean, it's the same thing um, in an orchestral situation as well. Like thinking about totally. how the timpani is going to project, and how you're going to anticipate and still sound with the orchestra, but it's it's. Uh, crazy when you're moving in a coordinated right. fashion around the field and you've memorized the whole book it's it's a little bonkers man honestly i don't think about it too much these days but <laughs> it's nuts <laughs> and like launching ahead like in in rio when you play in the samba schools down there you have like 400 drummers that way and the way Woo. they negotiate like that kind of because you have to be lockstep you have to be completely in time you know right yeah. there's no kind of phasing allowed and that so like the way they negotiate that is very different, you know, because they essentially put drum majors throughout the entire group, you know? Okay. And are they, so, um, I mean, we'll, we'll talk more about this because like hearing that story about you being in the middle of the room and all of them firing off at once that I had heard, like, yeah. 
Yeah, you know, we, I I do recommend that our audience listens to the interview that you did with uh, the discussions and percussion podcast. It was outstanding. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you, man. But that, that's a great podcast. They have a lot of good solid podcasts. podcast. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's great. Uh, but I just wonder if there's multiple um, essentially drum majors. Are they watching? A, how that's how the are thing. they it's coordinating? Like, I I mean, I say drum majors because it's a, that's the analog we have, right, but right, it's right. not like people are watching them for the time, you know? They're watching them for for directions, you know? Like yeah. this, this break is coming up and they're they're kind of like, you know, they're directing traffic, I think, more than they are like giving time. Oh, know, I in see. That sense. And, and they're watching each other? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, they're either watching each other or they're watching the one lead mestre at the front, you know? Cool. So there's one guy who's kind of like driving the entire bus and everybody else is like relaying signals, making sure that their area around them communicates and coordinates. Right. It's fascinating how like, you know, when when you have that many people, you have to find ways to kind of make that work and make that feasible and orchestras do it one way marching bands do it another way and samba schools do it another way yeah but like i i went down to brazil to kind of like run away from that world of marching band and get as yep. far away from it as i could and yeah, i yeah. found myself in the exact same spot like in <laughs> a giant gymnasium with a bunch of people playing snare drum you know like and traditional grip nonetheless you know yeah. like oh yeah totally <laughs> exactly you know and so it's it's just a different manifestation, I think, of like the same the same thing. People wanting to get together and play in big groups. Mm -hmm. yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, we we've taken a, a giant leap out of Texas into uh, Brazil. You real see quick. how quickly I get there? We could just talk about Brazil all day, boys. Like this is my favorite <laughs> thing to do. Yeah. It's no, true. It's okay. Let's but go like, back. Let's go back. Uh, it is true. We like there's, but yeah. I mean, that's Bob the meat and I and have done this. That's the meat and potatoes for sure. Yeah. But but. <laughs> I'm I'm I am curious about seeing it through to you getting to the point where you sure. met Nay and yeah. your interaction with the percussion studio there and and all that. So I mean, were you yeah. aware in high school after while you were marching that like this isn't quite my vibe. This isn't quite my tempo. Immediately, <laughs> as soon as okay. I got into high school, <laughs> not quite my like, tempo because I did junior high like marching band, but it wasn't marching band. It was like you played in the stands, you know. Yeah. And like, so you just learn tunes and you played in the stands and you had a cadence and it was fun. And then I got into high school and it was like, all right, you got to be here at seven in the morning and then we're going to run laps and do push ups. And I was like, whoa, whoa, this whoa, whoa, is whoa, not whoa. what I signed up for <laughs> at all. <laughs> like, I'm trying to be a musician here. We're sleeping in. Like, this is the whole point. No. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so like, I very, very quickly, I, I, I lasted, I think, a year or two years, something like that. I think by my senior year, anyway, of high school. I, would, I had dropped out. Yeah, um, likewise. Yeah. I, was, I was playing in um, a youth orchestra uh, in town called Greater Dallas Youth Orchestra, which was incredibly important for me because it was the first thing that got me out of the country. We like we yep. did a couple of European tours. Oh, really? And like for a kid growing up in Texas, like it was just – when you grow up in, in Texas, it's a very insulated environment. That, I mean, I took three years of Texas history. Wow. Yes, Three right. years of Texas history. I forgot wow, about dude. that. Yeah. This is how much of a beat of You do it this way. You do like Texas history for a year, then you do American history, and then you do world history. And then you repeat that cycle. So the lesson that you learn is that like Texas is just as important as all these other places, <laughs> oh, if not more wow. so. It's got its own. Yeah. Year, you know? That's so funny, like I, I, when I was a kid, I never thought I was going to leave Texas. I thought I was going to go to like Texas A&M and be an Aggie and like. That's it. And then Aggie. just leaving the country, I think, for the first time, I, I, went to, I went to England for the first time. Yep. And I thought at that age, I was like 14, like this will be a nice transition into traveling internationally because they all speak English. I'll know what's going on. It'll be great. I'm looking forward you, to it. You sitting and by the Lo London customs. bridges with tears in your eyes being like, some things are <laughs> no. bigger than in there in Texas. <laughs> 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 no, I got to customs and my customs agent was Scottish and I didn't understand a word he said. <laughs> and it was just like kind of an eye opening thing. Like this is the same language that I ostensibly speak and I can't understand this guy, you know, like it, yeah. that kind of stuff like really did break my head open a little bit. And the second <laughs> thing that really helped me get out was I saw a salsa concert. Mm. I was taking Spanish. I think I was maybe a sophomore or junior, something like that. And our Spanish teacher uh, 
was like this, I don't know, she must have been 20, late 20s or something like that. She was like the young, hip Spanish teacher that like all the boys in the class liked her and everything. And she brought me up after class one day. She goes, you're a drummer, right? And I'm all excited. Yeah, yeah, talk to me about drums. <laughs> and she goes, you should check this group out, Cubanismo. It's a salsa group. Wait, and they're coming to town next week. They're Take this pretty record famous, and, right? And go listen to it. They're hugely famous. They're amazing. Uh, Jesus Salome, I think, is the leader of that group. Mm. And like they were doing a big U.S. tour at the time, and I went to go see them in the same place that I saw, you know, Stomp and Nexus and, you know, oh, those yeah, other yeah, types yeah. of percussion sorts of things. And I saw them, and I was just blown away because it was the first time that I saw a band like that with a percussion up at the front of the stage, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. which was, you know, I'm be used to being playing in an orchestra way in the back. Like the, they're right up front and everybody's like dancing in the aisles as well too. Like another thing that I had just never really seen. Right. And, and that context, yep. you know, it was I, not I went to a lot of orchestral things. Type yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was not that at all. You know, Dallas does, you know, at the Meyerson, they don't get up and dance so much. And, you know, I'll say, you know, yeah, and yeah. these guys were making them do that. And it was incredible. And so I was blown away by them. Uh, that's when I started getting into like, oh, these are the other drums that I don't know anything about. And these are the ones that I'm going to, you know, I started trying to play congas in the jazz band. I got my first Giovanni Hidalgo album. I went to go see him at PASIC. Oh, nice. So like I got way into that kind of world. Okay. You know? So you would, you would take in this dive before you had gone to Miami. Like A the little bit. The seeds were already planted through this That's experience. why I went to Miami, you know, okay. because I wanted to be in Miami. Yeah. To be closer to, to that music. Yeah. And that culture, you know, which is funny because then like, then we spent all our time at UM in this very insular environment. Yeah. <laughs> and then Bob goes to the other side of, of the country <laughs> and gets deeper into that world and that particular world than like most of us did in Miami at all, you know? Well, mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of Latin American stuff happening at the school. In fact, that's it. What was happening was like pretty weak. We, I actually learned more from our fellow student, Luis Gonzalez, than I did from Me any too. teacher there about how to play congas or anything. Yep. You mean technically? Yeah, technically. And like okay. just, yeah, like musically how it works. Because he was the one who gave us exercises and like we would practice with that guy. I lived with him for a year and we would just shed all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Tremendous musician, uh, unbelievable drummer, that guy. Yeah. So, uh, well, let me ask you both then real quick. Because um, from my understanding, under Ney, there was like Brazilian ensemble. It was there Afro-Cuban ensemble or what was, mm -hmm. what was the programming like? And, you know, I assume that you both were ensconced in having to do marimba lit as well and everything. Yeah. And maybe rep, uh, classical rep. I don't know if either of you, I, I sort of uh, wiggled my way out of doing that when I was getting the orchestral degree. stuff. Hmm? Orchestral stuff, you mean? Like yeah. excerpts and things? Yeah. yeah. We, we got out of that, I think, almost entirely. <laughs> yeah. You know? I, I, I think I, we had that one class with Shannon, maybe. Yeah, same. That was, that was as that deep was as I got, it, yeah. was the class with Shannon. And I think the school changed. Like now it's, it's, it's different. And as I, cause I stayed there forever, you know, and yeah. like the last couple of years of it, it was more directed towards that. And there was more of that sort of stuff, but with I, that I, being classical or. It. Yes. I'm one of yeah. my, uh, classmates from, from school where I went, went to grad school at Miami after Nay had left, but now he oh, has really? landed a job in the Colorado symphony orchestra as a percussionist, you know? So uh, he, nice. he went to Miami to, polish his uh excerpts chops you know yeah it, it it changed over after nay and the and the new leadership there took it like in a completely different direction while we were there it was much more focused on we did like you know solo mallet rep and we did percussion ensemble things that sort of stuff you know uh but we also had brazilian ensemble which was hugely important to me obviously and i think a lot of people there yes um i in talking with uh, our miami folk you know over the past 10 years or something after we've all been out of college for a long time. That's one class that seems to come up with everybody who went through the percussion department. Cause we all did it at some point. Cause it was Nays, yeah. you know, baby project, you know, like that was, that was one where you could tell he was really having fun doing that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I was thinking about the, the, 
I forget what it was called, but like the the per, Afro Cuban percussion class with that guy, I don't remember. Marty Galagaraza. Yeah, I I I can't. Yeah, like I don't remember anything from that at all. But it it seemed my memory of it was not was that it wasn't memorable. <laughs> I mean, a lot of it was Luis Gonzalez teaching the class. You know, yeah, like, and and especially Richie, he took over afterwards, and he was always on tour. So Lewis taught a lot of those classes. I ended up teaching some of those classes. Mm -hmm. Marty, I remember uh, actually a, a lot, man, because like I, he was just, he was an old school player. He was a nice you know? guy so for like, sure. He was a super nice guy and he showed me a lot of music. Like he gave me some, I think he was the first guy who showed me like Los Papines. You, you actually, uh, no, that's important actually to me because he got you sure. Sierra Maestra. Yes, Sierra Which Maestro. Is like, yeah, I yeah, think yeah, totally. was actually the first too. Roomba CD that I had. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. We had a handful of those things. What else? Patato y Totico. The Muñequitos, I remember getting that album for sure. Early like, on. We had mu Muñequitos, right? Muñequitos, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, yeah, so he, he, it wasn't like he, he didn't teach a very rigid class where you learned a lot of technique and you learned a lot of chops or anything like that. But he did, he was like the first guy that I got to hang with and talk with who like listened to this shit all the time and grew up with it, you know? So he had a very different perspective than I did, obviously coming from Texas. Yeah. So I, I, I learned a lot from that guy just kind of indirectly by being around the music and just like, you know, I don't know, being with someone who played and lived that lifestyle. I, I think looking back, um, that was more influential than maybe I noticed at the time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You know, but, and then after that, it was, yeah, Luis Gonzalez would teach that class a lot. And, and he gave us all those exercises and just like patterns. And this is what you do for each part of the song. You I, know, like he was so, yeah, good. I learned so much more from Lewis than <laughs> for sure. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. For sure. You know, like uh, that, that guy ended up really showing me like technique and how to make sounds and things that I didn't really get at the time because I was very new to it. And it wasn't until later after having 10 years <clears throat> of doing those exercises, you start to get, you know, a, a better result from it than we were that, at that time, I think. Right. Yeah. Um, but I learned a lot in those classes. Then I had um, Richie, uh, Richie Bravo. Did you overlap with him? Very Bob? briefly. I Like I... I think I, see, I, I think I stopped taking those classes. Like I didn't do it oh. all four years. Oh, I don't think I ever stopped taking those classes. I would just go even if I wasn't signed up because <laughs> Lewis was there and we would just, yeah. out, you know. <laughs> and Bob, but Bob, you were a percussion major, right? You weren't doing composition at this time as a major or? Uh, yeah, that... I actually was dipping my toes though and taking some classes, but I was a percussion major. But I was using mm -hmm. some of my electives. You were a percussion major, but you were composing at the time. You know, oh, like yeah, when for you sure. came in, you know, like you <clears> had <throat> like, what was the group? Devention? Yeah. <laughs> Is that the high school group? Yeah. You know, like you had, you came in with like these CDs of like, these are tunes that I recorded and that I wrote with my bandmates. Yeah. And I think a lot of us who were coming in from like just the, the high school band or orchestral angle, like we didn't have that in our heads at all. Even mm. that you could write music, you know, like other people write the music, you play it. Like interesting. <laughs> yeah. You know? So like I mean, Bob that, had that very early on. That leads me to just. Uh, um, it's been really nice talking to these people that I've known or have not known, but you know, people coming from the UM program during this time. I'd I'd love to hear your perspective because it just it it does seem like a really exciting and collaborative place. Did you feel like even though you weren't. Um, writing at the time where you were you finding yourself in situations where you're like yeah sure i'll play on that or whatever or just or being in bands and then seeing other people's projects through as zany as they are because that's kind of the the spirit that i yeah. get i don't know if that was your experience per uh specifically though that's that's 100 percent it i i would say there were three kind of remarkable things about the um experience from a percussionist perspective is that like a like you know the the program was very um, very open yeah. to whatever you wanted to do. You had a lot of freedom and a lot of agency and personal choice and things that you were doing within that program. Nate didn't have like a, like a dogmatic scheme that you had to go through, yeah. you know? Yeah. So like you could really kind of pursue the thing that you wanted to do, you know? And, and for Bob, that was composition. 
Mm -hmm. And so he ended up writing a lot for the percussion ensemble and stuff like that. I think I found parts of yours, you know, still like in my box over here from those days, you know. (laughs) Yeah. And for me, it was kind of more like I he gave me the chance to teach a lot. He gave me the chance to run ensembles. Mm -hmm. He he gave me the chance to play in other groups, like we were talking about the salsa group or the Brazilian group, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh the the other two things about the the school that were really amazing were the jazz program, being near the jazz program and jazz adjacent. Yeah. Because like as a percussionist, you get called into it all the time. Like, we need somebody to play wind chimes, you know? Like yeah. da 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 da. And you run over there with your your bag of toys and like jump in with CJB or jump in with all of these other CJB groups. CJB being the that were like winning downbeat jazz awards band. and just yeah, dude. Yeah. yeah, CJB was that was like the number one jazz yeah. band at at UM. Um, uh, mm. akin to like the one o'clock band at UNT. Right. Yeah. Um, that's sort of I thing. just to speak a little bit to Mark's question. I do remember just like and like countless instances of just like people hanging out and being like, "Oh, you record this or let's jam this now or like we're gonna do this thing for the show mm-hmm. here and like." you come up with your part like so like to some extent i remember you being like pretty handy on just like all like being all over the place playing with a lot of people just showing up and making up a part or whatever like fitting in yeah. and finding your space yeah that i i liked that about like doing those things with the other groups just like um getting to make your own choices yeah, as a percussionist, instead of reading the reading the ink, as we had all like been kind of made to do from the get go. Yeah, I definitely really like that, and uh, and and there were so many different um, avenues and different groups to jump in with. You know, like there were the ones like at school, like like the CJB and the Brazilian Ensemble, R and B Ensemble, and they would have like different themed <laughs> Ensemble, forget, Tower Power Ensemble. I forgot ensembles, about the R and B Ensemble. <laughs> Yeah. Chuck Burrs are on baby. Yeah. Um, that's that's really interesting. I'm all the percussionists that I've worked. Uh, so sorry that that'd be Bob, Andrew, and Geneva that I've worked with closely over the years. I've always admired uh, the confidence and the sense of freedom that y'all have in terms of choosing choosing uh, textures and and sounds and instruments that are going to fit in in a certain way. And I have. Personally, as a composer, you know, someone running a band, I have greatly benefited from this multiple times. And I've I've never, as a, you know, I have a, um, a background in percussion. I'm, I mainly do vibes now, but, like, uh, I I never had that type of confidence or, or, like, just willing to kind of get in there like that. So it's, it's really cool that that seems like that was part of the whole hang. Yeah, you know? I, I bet you a lot of that comes from, from Nay and just, like, how open and supportive of a guy he really is you know yeah like he, he he would he would foster those types of feelings in you and like give you give you agency within the program and allow you to make your own decisions yeah and then just being put in those types of situations with other high level musicians from all over the country mm. where you know you made these choices and like you found out very quickly what worked and what didn't work yeah you know like I, I learned a lot by being in those groups and even like playing in the wedding bands around Miami and stuff like that. Like Luis Gonzalez got speaking of him again, got me a bunch of those types of gigs <laughs> where it's like, you just had to like jump on with a wedding band that had a whole list of like 200 tunes that we're going to do. And right. like Lewis had like a method for like what you do on all of these songs, like what you do in the verse of let's stay together versus what you do in the chorus as a percussionist, you know? Wow. And, and so like, I, I I learned through him and through doing those types of gigs as well too, just like what to try and Did where. Did you play with him uh, on gigs like that? Yeah, totally. A lot of times where he was doing <laughs> drum set and I would do percussion. And he would you tell know? you what to do. I've been in that situation. And he would times. exactly tell me what to <laughs> yeah. do. It was, I, it, <laughs> yeah. Dude, it was so good for me because I had no idea what to do. Yeah. Like on you the know? stage? Would he be talking yeah. over? Like, all right. And, and beforehand, because we lived together at the time, like we would figure out tunes. I have I have distinct memories of us like, you know, writing out like all of the hits and writing out charts to some Mark Anthony tune that we were going to do, you know, like, yeah, like we would, we would pregame these things a lot ahead of time and just talk about like what works in pop percussion settings, which is like not a thing. We didn't get any of that at UM, right? I mean, that was not, I, 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 I didn't get any of that anyway. That was not what was like prescribed to us or like the curriculum was made up for, you know, it was like, we learned 
drum set, you learn mallets, you learn yeah. congas, da, 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 da. but how to fit into those other types of groups and like assume a different role. No, I, I, I got that all from like, from working, I think mostly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely learned some of that later. Not at, not at time. I, I remember at least for me at the time, like more than anything, what I was doing was playing marimba. Yeah. I think for you too. Me too. Probably. Totally. Yeah. 100%. That was the main instrument. Marimba and vibes, I guess, as well, too. But, like, mallet instruments, yeah. I think, was was the main thing. And, like, there's just not that many marimba gigs. <laughs> nope. You know? No. And, and furthermore, there's, moving that thing is a, a beast. You it's know? terrible. Like, I, it's such a beautiful instrument. I love playing it. I, w I wish I had one here. And... Yeah, and Mark's got one can now. See my my Stevens. Oh, you do? Because yeah. I got a marimba in the studio, so now I got my Stevens grip coming back here. My my little blisters here, but nice. um, but yeah, I mean, before I had a vibraphone, I had a four and a half octave marimba, so that that would expand the repertoire for me. This was in early high school, something like that. But I would drag that thing to my church a lot of the mm -hmm. time and go play Bach before the services and stuff and. Yeah. Once I, once I essentially traded that straight up for a vibraphone, that changed everything for me. I yeah. was like, oh, my God, this is so much chiller. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and I think it's probably maybe a more versatile instrument within, like, the, the musical languages and the worlds yeah. that we play within as well, too. It's got more of a role. And, and yeah, I, I, so much of what we were doing was, like, learning solo marimba repertoire. Yep. Yeah. I, and I did like, all that I've, thing I've for sure. not made one cent <laughs> from solo marimba repertoire. Not that it's impossible, but like, I, you know, like it's just, it, I don't think it's really reflective of the world that's out there necessarily. Yeah. You know, and you have to kind of make your own work and make your own headway. That, Nade did that as well too, right? He wrote all of his yeah. own pieces, would play his own pieces. Also just, could teach just his own owning, pieces, have his own owning one is like... I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't own one because I have never had the space, never had the money, the space, you know? Right. It's like, what? You have to, you have to really set up your life to own a marimba. <laughs> totally. It's a car. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's worth more than most of the cars I've ever had. But <laughs> exactly. um, I got one in here because, like, a percussionist friend, like, I'm in my little studio that I have, but a percussionist friend moved in here and he was pumped because he had a marimba that was taking up a ton of space somewhere else and I was like please please move in here we have space for it and to have a marimba in the fold for recording projects would be amazing so it is it's really cool to have around but I'm not going to go out and gig on one you know now but there are certain groups that do I, we say all this that I, I, I haven't found a marimba gig but like I'm addicted now to watching this group Son Rope Pera mm. which is I think they're a Mexican group they're, I, they mostly play in Mexico anyway that I've seen on Instagram and it's like a cumbia like punk group what? oh wow you know? they're all these like tatted up dudes shirtless what? just like smashing the marimba don't, 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 don't. Yeah. <laughs> they have like a bongo player and like a weirdo player and this guy just like plays melodies of smashing notes and yelling and it's just like it's total rock and roll it's freaking, oh man that sounds it's amazing sick, you know? but like culturally down there the marimba is way more popular right yeah i mean because there's there's a long marimba heritage in mexico and central america for sure you yeah know? yeah they would talk about that a lot because he used to go there all the time. There were always like marimba festivals in that part of the world, you know. Um, and I and I remember it being like kind of addressed. Like the they're speaking of like Nexus again. They had like a one particular rag that was called like the Spanish rag or something like that. And they were like, and this one we use the Mexican marimba with its buzzing resonators, <laughs> you know. And it was like it was like this little one trick pony they did on there. But there was a whole freaking world of that sort of stuff and a lot of folk music that's on that instrument. Yeah. Not to mention anything going back to Africa and all that yeah. sort of stuff, you know. So like there's a long big lineage to marimba playing that also probably gets ignored a lot. In mm. those programs that we go to here, you know, it's interesting. Oh, yeah, I mean, because the the modern instrument is pretty removed from the folkloric, uh, in how it's used, how it's like the technique, like, yep, it's like yeah, the the four mallet yeah. thing alone, you don't see that so much in a lot of the folkloric styles. Yeah, um, and then the the keyboard layout at, laid out like a piano, not in some kind of diatonic, you know, straight fashion, that sort of stuff, right. It's, it's very, very different. However, like, you know, now I'll watch videos of those guys and, and 
you can see that like that's where the instrument comes from that's where the lineage comes from so mm. why why don't we like try and bring that kind of way of playing into it a yeah little bit connect more. connect Whereas the i think a dots. lot of times we just try and be pianists yeah yeah i mean i feel like that um that is going to be a bigger part of the conversation moving forward in schools in general just you know at the school that i work at we we talk a lot about decolonizing the repertoire you know mm -hmm. and acknowledging um <clears throat> where music has come from and it's and its history and the importance of you know black american composers and african composers and and you know i think that what you're talking about is really hitting on something that's probably we're probably going to be seeing that change at least with forward thinking programs you know i think that yeah it'd be cool to to see that as well because you know i i came up my whole goal was to play merlin you know like i i yep. learned merlin and, and like boom cool and uh um, Merlin? I'd have to Merlin. 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 Yeah. I remember that one. Was yeah. that Mark Ford? Uh Andrew Andrew Thomas. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I don't... But I mean it's like the you know, the Nancy Zeltzman recorded it. This is like right. when you get into Marimba, this is what you want to do kind of exactly. thing. Exactly. I don't think I ever achieved those levels, man. I don't think I even oh. know what this I've never even heard of this. No, piece. you definitely do. Like that was her I heard that name before. I, Wanda may have played that. I I never did though. Well, we we played a lot of Michi. Yeah. The the Meech, as Wanda would call it all the time. <laughs> Play the Meech. We played a lot of Nerizaro uh, is what we did. We played a ton yeah, yeah. of Nerizaro. <laughs> obviously. Yeah, a ton of Nerizaro. <laughs> we went we we like premiered his second vibraphone concerto. Hell yeah. I think. Was that it? Yeah, at PASIC in like two thousand two. Uh I, Sick. I it's kind of Were for you me, I kind of lost track, but I think I think that was O two. But anyway, but we played we played a ton of his rep, and he he liked teaching his rep because that's what he knew, you know. And like that's, I, I think that was like a to him a more honest place to teach from. It it yeah. made a lot of sense just, as a you. student too. I, like I would rather study Nay's music with Nay than any other kind yeah. of music because he knows he understands how to teach it, you know. And there's a lot of techniques baked into his pieces that are uh -huh. that you yeah learn by just by learning it yeah well, he would write those pieces to learn techniques you know a lot of them anyway yeah yeah right as, he would like starting he, as uh, etudes but then would develop exactly. into full-on ensemble pieces exactly exactly so uh, you learned a lot from from doing his stuff with him the other thing that i i, I remember him telling me um on one of the trips, we used to teach together at a camp in Orlando, and we would drive back and forth. And one of the one of the drives back, we were talking about um, just his career stuff, and and you know mm -hmm. how he got to where he was in life. I'm you know the young kid trying to ask questions, that sort of stuff. And he said that like he, you know, like I, I think even to this day, he'll he'll admit it that it, it does happen sometimes. He feels like he doesn't necessarily get the uh, the respect in the in the U.S percussion community mm -hmm. that he does other places because he lots he writes a lot of very tonal music and yeah. diatonic music yeah. and like all the stuff that was like kind of put up on the pedestal was this crazy atonal like through composed madness and that sort of stuff you yeah, know yeah, that is absolutely. not his and vibe. he would write very beautiful melodies and like that's just what he liked writing and so he would do that and he would get lots of blowback from that sort of stuff that's and he said to me that like the most important thing is that you do your own work, you know, mm -hmm. and in writing your own stuff and doing your own work and, and like going after things that you want to do, but nobody else can really tell you the right way to do that sort of thing. Whereas if you try and like just follow somebody else's pathway or model yourself after somebody else, you know, whatever you do in your, in your music career, you have to do it honest to yourself and your own experience. Yeah. Be because otherwise you're, you're just putting yourself out and available to all types of like kind of valid criticism if you're just trying to like do something else that's already existing, you know? Yeah. If you were putting something out that is new into the world, nobody else has really anything to say about it other than like, you know, accepting what that is. Yeah. So I think he, he liked writing for that perspective because it gave him like a, you know, that was what he loved doing. You know? Exactly. Yeah. That's well, yeah. And that's a, a lot of respect. And I think that a lot of, uh, you know, I've, I've struggled with that. And and also, 
like quite frankly, like writing a lot on the vibraphone, it's a very beautiful sounding instrument. So uh, I've had to work a lot with, if I want to get something more dissonant, I have to work a lot with yeah. like uh, dissonant interval structures. Otherwise, it's just probably going to sound nice. You know, <laughs> right. it's inherently dulcet tones. I mean, they made that thing to yeah. be beautiful. It does a very good job. Of it. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. But anyway, anyway, man. Um, <laughs> all right. So, um, how? So, I I guess I'm not sure where to go next. But maybe a next good question is how what what led you to then graduate, do a master's and then do a doctorate all at UM? Dude, they kept throwing those TAs at me where it was like, you know, they give you a free degree and a nice little, you know, thousand dollar stipend or whatever it was every month. And like at that moment it was like, wow, that's like a job. That's almost like a real job. Yeah. Yeah. So and you I just, I stayed because like there was, you know, I, I, I looked at other places, you know, I remember, you know, uh, Bob, when you made the decision to go off to Cal Arts and like, I looked at that place at one point as well too. I think I looked at Denmark. Oh yeah. You know, a few different spots, but like <clears throat> UM was offering me the opportunity to continue on in a program that I was already enjoying and a place that I enjoyed living in a city that I enjoyed living. With a teacher you were mm -hmm. really connecting with. With a teacher that I really connected with. Like that guy was like a, you know, a second father figure to me for sure. You know, yeah. I, I draw a lot of inspiration from that guy. So it would, it would be hard to leave him in that sense, I guess. But also they, yeah, they, they gave me that comfortable position where the, I could keep playing uh, in the groups that I already was playing with and growing there. And, and it just, it just made sense. I don't recommend it to a lot of people, you know, <laughs> yeah. like I think getting all of your degrees at one place is like kind of a waste of it especially if you're paying for it, you know, but I, I, the big thing that I tell people about music school is just don't ever pay for it. Yeah. I, I, you know, like it's just, it's just so expensive yeah. for the amount of financial return that you get out of having one of those degrees. Right. That it's like, you're better off going somewhere where you're going to be, you know, where you're going to have a scholarship or something like that. And maybe you aren't studying with the teacher that you want or whatever, because like when you get out of school, I was lucky enough to get out of all those years, years of school without any student loans. Yeah. Home. Yeah. That's great. And that, I, I don't know that many other people who have that story, you know? Yeah. It's true. Like a lot of people end up paying like some kind of student loans along the way from moving and da, 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 you know, like, and I got out of that entirely, which I was lucky. Yeah. Yeah. That is very lucky. And, um, that was also a huge informer on where I went. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I went to Lamont School of Music at Denver University where I grew up, but I knew most of the faculty. I knew that they had both strong jazz and classical programs, and um, but they also were willing to help me out significantly, you know? Yeah, man, and I, th I think that makes such a huge difference because, like, you don't know what you're doing at that age. No. <laughs> You don't know like how much money that is well, that you're they're, spending. They're making you sign those things in the admissions office. That's horrible, dude. I, yeah, I feel 40, like thousand dollars. Send it out. Like uh, it's all made up money to you. You've done nothing <laughs> but play Monopoly at that point in your life. You yeah. know, like so, like it doesn't really make any <laughs> any sense to you. Yeah, you know. So I, 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 that's always my advice to people is just kind of like you know, go go and get the experience for sure because like I wouldn't trade it for the world. I met so many good friends at at UM. Yeah, the people are uh, killer. The yeah. people are amazing. All of our networks, like we all still talk to each other, but even within the city of Miami and like all the people that I play with now, like around town, like they're all maybe like 10 years younger than me, but they're all from UM for the most part, you know? Yeah. And so like I did overlap with them for like that last final year or two or something like that. Or we know the same people. Yeah. Like that circle that you get from there, that's huge. Uh, and that can be worth paying for, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. But you can Experience you can get in community. You can get the circle without paying for it, ostensibly. That you can. Yeah. You can just go and hang out at these places yeah. a lot. You know, like I, I don't know that everybody has the uh, the huts, but to do so always. But like you, you can. Yeah. You know? Well, but I can I, I can attest to yeah. that for sure. Yeah. For sure, for sure. So then, um, that's uh, you know. Let's see, four years plus two years for a master. I mean, I don't, I, yeah, and I also don't want to make it sound like it was just like, oh, these guys are giving me a thousand dollar check. I'm going to stick around for that. It was also because, like, 
you know, I, I really did enjoy teaching or working with Nay, and he gave me a ton of responsibilities that I would not have normally gotten had I gone anywhere else. Yeah, right. Was I like a new student somewhere else? I would not have been entrusted with the same stuff that I was. Yeah. So like there, I was like conducting ensembles, I was teaching lessons, I was doing all these things that I still do to this day, and I got th- this wealth of experience. And I learned a really, really valuable lesson about like what higher education is like behind the scenes a little bit because <laughs> I came back from my doctorate. I did, I did two years of a master's and then I was going to leave at that point because I had done, you know, six years of UM, like it's enough already. <laughs> yeah. And Nay said, no, 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 I'm going on sabbatical next year. Do you mind just coming back for like just the first year of your doctorate to kind of cover this year while I'm on sabbatical uh-huh. and teach these classes for me and all this sort of stuff. Sure, I'll do that, Nay. And so, like, I came back and I did that year <laughs> thinking, like, I'm not going to finish this degree, but I'm just going to, like, do this year. Yeah. And, like, get this experience and and cover for Nay and, you know. And I, I met some new people that year. Darcy Timmerman was a, was a teacher who came in that year. I think Ted Atkatz came in that year as well, too. And, the, and they were the official, like, leads. But because I was experienced and I was the TA had been there the longest, I ended up being the person who was drawn upon for information. I would go to faculty meetings and like- Oh, really? And I just saw how the sausage was made and dude, it's it's ugly, horrendous. <laughs> it was like going to high school all over again. You yeah, know? yeah. Being on the admin type level is a little, little spooky. I saw firsthand how much just bureaucracy- Yeah, definitely. That is, you know, and, and it, it terrified me. Yeah. <laughs> to the point that like, I, I, to this day, I teach at Barry University. But I'm adjunct faculty there. Yeah. And that's a good spot for me because I just go in and teach. You know, that's a very different thing than like doing the full time stuff and being responsible for all of that extra bureaucracy and that sort of stuff, you know? Yeah. And doing any any type of PD, professional development or anything can be really difficult for sure. But I mean, the other cool thing that happened, and, and maybe this is a good way to sort of transition a little bit, is at this point, uh, in writing your dissertation, I don't know if this was your first trip, but you went down to Rio. And, yeah. and you interviewed um, Marcos, my, Susano. Marcos Susano. Yeah, Marcos Susano. And so at this point, you were already obviously, and, and just so everyone knows, like Bob told me a while ago that like you ended each recital at each yeah. level with, <laughs> right. with a big, big showpiece on Pandero, right? A so big like Pandora solo where I would just make up whatever I wanted to do. Again, going back <laughs> to just like having the freedom to do whatever you want. I yeah. really liked that part of the recital because I did all this rep that I just had to memorize in forever. And I got to the end, I just got to play. And everybody really liked that. And oh, I ended so, on wait, a very those happy were improvised. Note. Yeah. I mean, I would sketch them out beforehand, you know, like okay. I'm going to do a samba for this long and then I'm going to go to a bio. You know, like I had ideas, but I was improvising within that. And I, I was just kind of playing. I remember, but I, uh, Bob, even by your senior recital in undergrad, we were expecting that from you. <laughs> yeah, because I think we, we, we found it our yeah. freshman year. Like, as I remember this, like my freshman year. We all got the Pandora. Uh, that, we, took yeah. that, we, we took that percussion techniques class. So there is yours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like one day was Brazilian day and he came and he showed us all the different samba drums. And at the end, he showed us Pandero. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember that. And I remember... Watching him play that and just being like, that's crazy. I've never seen anybody hold a tambourine like that. <laughs> In fact, like I remember picking it up and trying to play it like a Rick and Nate just like grabbed it. He was like, no, <laughs> he just took it. Like, <laughs> Yo, and, and just so it's people listening, uh, no, a Pandero is like a, you know, a Brazilian tambourine. I, out of anyone on this call, I'm not the one to explain this. So would one of y'all <laughs> take this real quick? Please, uh, Bob, you've got one right there. Tell us what a what a bandeira uh, is. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's basically the Brazilian frame drum tambourine. Um, the main yeah. sort of difference, aside from the technique, is the jingles, which are closed like hi hats, <clears throat> so that it makes a shorter right. sound as opposed to the kind of like the the more open jangly sound that a tambourine has. So it allows for like really tight uh, rhythms and the head. Is played with the thumb on the left. The left hand holds the instrument, <clears throat> and you use you use your thumb to change the pitch of the drum. So it's very mm-hmm. versatile. You can get a lot of sounds from it. You use your right hand to play. Uh, it's got a very specific technique that doesn't really translate to almost any other instrument. Um, yeah. 
But what's weird is that like it totally translates to other instruments within Brazilian percussion. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah. So like the pandero, <laughs> the right hand style that you play on the pandero, um, you can play. There's another instrument called hipiki jimau. That's with which is the skin. It's 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 basically it's like a. I mean, I have one here. Hold on, one second. <laughs> okay, standing by. Jimau, and like this is like the hipiki of. Wood, hippie of skin. What is it, Mao? Portuguese me. It's basically like a single-headed tom, you know. Yeah, it's a single-headed oh, yeah, drum. This, like it this looks puppy. like. It looks like a trash can, you know, right? Essentially, just open on one side, but you play. With your thumb, the same oh. way that you do the pandero as well, too. And, like, you split your hand in different places. And, like, where this drum comes from, uh, oddly enough, is it comes from a drum set. There was a group called Fundu G. Quintal, which was a, a, a samba pagode group in the late 70s, early 80s, that kind of, like, <clears throat> defined that style of music for later generations. And they played at this place called Cacique G. Hamos, which was a club, a samba club. And they had like a drum set in the corner there. And when they would play like table samba, like instead of marching, they would just sit around the table and play. Yeah. They would grab like the drums from the drum set and play them with that kind of technique that's related to Pandero technique, you know, and put them on these drums. And so like they have a bigger one where they just took the floor tom and that plays another voice. And they have another one that became the sword, you know? Yeah. Like, so this sounds so like, like maybe the, would you, the te Pandero technique is, being applied to these drums? I, I, I don't know if I could go that far, but I can say that there is just kind of like this thing in Brazilian percussion a lot where you see instruments that have like um, hand-specific functions. <laughs> this is a terrible way of describing this, you know? But like you don't, you, where, where on like, you know, drums, you have two sticks and you can make the same sound with those two sticks and Kong is you have two hands, you make the same sound with two hands, you know? Yeah. Like, and, and playing Pandero, it's like you have the right hand that does this job to make the sound and the left hand does this job and together they make that sound. Yeah. You know, the same thing with the Hepiki Jimau because like you're playing one hand on the shell, another yeah. hand on the head. There's another drum called Hepiki Gianel, which is like ring repiki. Oh. And you wear rings and you play on the side of the drum and oh. the top of the head. You which, know? which, so Mao, what is, what is the other... Mao is hand, oh, okay. mano, you know? Gotcha. So hippiki jimao is the hippiki of the hand. Um, and yeah, and so like birimbao, that's another one as well too, yeah. right? You, you have the one hand that's playing, like attacking the string and the other hand that's changing the pitch mm -hmm. that holds a kashishi. Like they're completely separate, but they make this one instrument. That I think is something you see in a lot of different Brazilian percussion instruments. That's interesting. Interesting. Huh. So, so you had been, you had been getting... You became enamored in that initial class. You were becoming more and more serious about becoming a student of the Pandero. Mm -hmm. And then at what point did you travel to Brazil? And, and when did you start interacting with someone like Marco Susano and and um, becoming really serious about it? And sure. And this, this is starting to shape your musical identity now. Yeah, yeah. It, it, was, it was from the get-go. So the first time I went was 2005. It was right after my undergrad degree. Oh, okay. And I had like saved up, you know, all the money I had, which was like $1,500. Wait, when did you yeah. do that? It was it was right after our undergrad. Like in that summer, summer after our undergrad. Really? I think you were still in Miami at this point. It was before I moved into that house off of Bird Road. <laughs> I was in Miami you know? being irresponsible. <laughs> yes, you were. <laughs> 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 you had a good summer of that one. That's another podcast. Yeah. Um, my summer was fun <laughs> as well, too. Um, and I, I just took all the money I had. I went down to Brazil. I had a couple of friends. I had some people that Ney connected me, connected me with in Rio. Um, I had uh, uh, my friend Douglas Laura, who I moved in with later that, oh, that summer yeah. in Forgot Miami. That guy. He lived in Sao Paulo. I, I went and visited him and his brother there. And I went to Salvador by myself. I didn't know anybody. I got, I just wandered around there. Wow. Um, but it was, that was a super, another eye opening experience to leave the country and travel and all this sort of stuff. But also because I had spent the previous four years being like the one guy at UM who was into Brazilian music. And then I go there and like, it's my people, you know, like all these people, like know yeah. all the stuff that I do and way more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? 
and yeah. it, and it, it like it got me super excited about getting more and more into that music. Um, and then I came back to to Miami and I did the other two degrees, but that was always like in the back of my mind of wanting to go back. And I did my doctorate. Like I said, I started while Nay was on sabbatical. He was down in Rio, actually, I think, playing with the Zamba School for that sabbatical. Oh, cool. He came back up. <clears throat> they did another year and then, or maybe a year or half a year, something like that. And then he left. He retired. And they went to go find another guy. I was bummed about like him leaving. I didn't know if I wanted to do school anymore. I left. I, I left school. And I stayed in Miami. And I just started working around town. Um, and those were like the first types of gigs that I was doing where I was just sitting with all these other groups and doing a lot of the stuff that I do now. Um, mm -hmm. I had one gig. I remember playing with this guy, Cleveland Jones, who was another dude like me, white guy who was super into Brazilian music. And I'd bring my pandeiro and I'd play out there. And so I got like a taste of just like, just working for money, you know, like as a musician, which I wasn't really doing while I was in school. Right. And it affirmed that that is what I wanted to do. And it also affirmed that I did not want to go back to school for three years to get a doctorate somewhere else. But I already had like pretty much two years of a doctorate like done at UM. Were you like all but dissertation at that point? Or? Nah, I still had like one more year classes and the dissertation to do, but okay. like close, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I went back. Um, uh, the new instructor there, Svet Stoyanov, was nice enough to give me a, the TA spot back. I went back and I finished my degree there. And like one of the stipulations of me doing that degree there was that my last recital, I would get to like do whatever I want. And the paper was going to be about Bandero or of my choosing anyway. And that's what I chose Bandero and Marco Susano in particular. Yeah. And Nay of all people tried to talk me out of that. He wasn't even teaching there anymore. And he was like, man, you should do Gary Burton. Like he lives right down here. You could be the guy who interviews Gary Burton. And I was just like, I don't think that's, that's, I'm not that guy, Nay. I'm not the guy to do the Gary Burton paper, you well, know, I'm and, the guy. And quite frankly, Gary Burton has been interviewed plenty of I'm times. Sure. And yeah. I don't know how many times people have interviewed Marco Susano, you know, like, and, Certainly and it seems less. like, yeah, I think you did the right thing. <laughs> I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy with my decision for sure. Yeah. But like, um, yeah. So then I went back to, to school so that I could finish it so that I could have it done and be done with that degree and so that I could teach later on, you know, like I thought it would be useful for sure. Oh, certainly. But, yeah. Dude, the biggest thing that I got out of it was doing that dissertation. Yeah. And the connections that I made from that dissertation, because that became like the stronghold of my career and the, I, you know, like so much of my musical identity is defined around, you know, that, yeah, that dissertation. Uh, it was how, so I, I went to a a a Javon concert with Ney while Javon, um, right. yeah Javon remember yeah. him uh, a Brazilian pop star that Ney was super into he took me to that show Susana was playing on that show he got us backstage oh, wow. to go talk to Susano and I was like I want to do my doctoral dissertation on you do you mind if you... <laughs> and so he he gave me his he like he gave me his number he gave me his email he gave me his address he was like yeah just hit me up you'll come down you can stay with me it'll be a great time I'm like this is so amazing I'm like walking on cloud nine I go home I send him an email I don't hear anything I send him another email I don't I don't hear anything like for months from this guy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and like the summer is about to end. I'm going to have to go back to school. And like, I'm already taking paper writing classes. And it's like, if I don't have this interview, I don't have a paper. Yeah. So I just bought a ticket to go to Rio and I was hoping that I could find him and that he was going to be in town <laughs> because <laughs> if I don't get this interview, I don't have a paper and I have to change the entire trajectory of my doctoral degree. Yeah. That is so bonkers. I mean, so I, I bought a ticket. I went down there and I picked up the phone and I called him as soon as I got there and he picked up. He <laughs> was like, Oh, Hey Brian, it's you. Come on by. Yeah. All Glad right. you're here. You know? Yeah. And, it, and it was just the nicest guy. I, I mean, our friend Richard Hargit, Bob Ledoux, uh, put this to me this way. He said, you know, sometimes you have to climb the mountaintop to go see the wizard. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Can't just call him. And like, um, you can't just call him. Email doesn't work that way. Uh, how's your Portuguese yeah. at this point? In your life, uh, I'm melhorando I, muito. I've I have a very weird uh, Portuguese accent. Nay makes makes some fun of it to this day <laughs> because I speak with a very Rio de Janeiro carioca accent. I mean, I don't sound like I'm from Rio. I sound like I learned in Rio. Yeah, you know? sure. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, I I speak a lot of 
slang. I took like two years, a year or something like two semesters, something like that of Portuguese at UM. But like, you know, I, I didn't get too much from that. I, I had some Spanish, but I wasn't speaking it or anything. I really learned by just going down there and hacking my way through really difficult conversations with people <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> for a long time. And there's many people down there who speak better English than I speak Portuguese. And so we just speak English. But a lot of the people that I ended up meeting, the further I went, it became clear that like, all right, I have to pick up this Portuguese thing. And so I would, I would do things like I, I reread the Hobbit in Portuguese. Oh, wow. You know, I, 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 I would try and find things that I already knew, you know, and mm -hmm. like, and read them in Portuguese or sh watch shows dubbed in Portuguese that I already knew <laughs> so that like I could fill everything in with context clues, you know? Right. Yeah. And so I, I did a lot of that. I, and then I would just go down like, I, so I did the, the dissertation that was, you know, 2011, I think I went for that interview. I graduated in 2012. And then starting the, that year, I would just go down three, four times every year, something like that. I think I've been like th around 30 times at this point. And like 29 of those times were in the last 10 years, you know? Yeah. Right on. So I hit a rhythm of just going over and over again. And the reason I did that is because of... Uh, two guys that I met through Susano, uh, Bernardo Aguiar mm -hmm. and Gabriel Policarpo. Okay. They have a group called Pandero Hippiki Duo, which is a duo of a Pandero player, Bernardo, and a Hippiki player, Gabriel. And I saw them down there when I was, uh, I think it was the same trip where I went for the interview. Uh, they were like releasing their first CD with that duo. And they did like, they did a show in a little black box theater that was like an hour and a half long show with two drums. Yeah. I know. It's sick, dude. It, they're so <laughs> sick. They're incredible. With two drums. I they, know. They, the stories that they could tell with two drums yeah. was really something amazing to me. And like I, I, all I knew was that like these guys had it and I needed to be around them. I, yeah. So that, that was another question. When did your relationship with Bernardo begin? And, uh, yeah, it was... Yeah, it was right around then, you know. Right like, then, uh, that's okay. I went. I saw them. I saw them that year in 2011, and then I think I went back the next year because <laughs> Bernardo and I hit it off real quick. Gabrielle and I hit it off real quick. Gabrielle mm -hmm. came to Miami, maybe like a year later, and stayed with me in Miami. I remember going to pick him up at the airport and being like, "Dude, I don't speak a lick of Portuguese. This guy's gonna live in my house for like two weeks. Like, how <laughs> how is this gonna happen?" And we connected so well yeah. Yeah. through YouTube. <laughs> like the end of every night, like we would go out and see a show, we'd go do something, and then we would come home and we would sit down in like these two recliners and, and Richard Hargett's house down in Homestead. He was gone at the time. <laughs> and we would just pass the remote back and forth. Like, check out this YouTube video. Oh. Check out this YouTube video. This is one that I know that he doesn't know. This is one he knows that I don't know. We would just pass it back and forth. We called it Utubi Tem Tudo, which means <laughs> YouTube has everything. <laughs> yes. And we just go back and forth, like sharing videos like that. Like, uh, check out this Maori drumming. Check, you know, just random stuff. Yeah. And like, so I started connecting with those guys like very quickly because it, we're, we're all drum nerds. Like, that's a language I could speak for sure. Yeah. And yeah. So it was easy to convince them, like, hey, there's this convention in the United States called PASIC. I can get you guys a clinic there. And so that's how we really started working together, was I brought them up to do. Uh, PASIC in Texas, uh -huh. I think. Was that the trip that we went out and saw you, Bob? I think it was. I believe so. Because yeah. we did two PASICs in a row, but I think it was that one. I brought them to Texas. We went out to, to, to San Fran and Oakland. We did some shows out there with Bob. Um, and I think we went to Miami as well, too, on that run. But we went to PASIC to give this clinic on, like, it was like a clinic performance where they played like for 30 minutes and then we did 30 minutes on these instruments. Yeah. Oh. And because I, I, I basically did the translating. I basically ran the clinic, that kind of stuff, you know? Did you play okay. with them? Wait. On that one I did, like we did like a little trio at the end where I played Pandero, you know, with them because like I was already deep in the Pandero thing. I think Bernardo and I had already started on the method that we ended up finishing recently. Oh, like, really? Yeah. We were already working on this stuff together. The groove art. And, and we'll be we'll be talking about that a little bit. For sure. Yeah. As well. Um, just real quick, out of curiosity, you 
and PRD played in Oakland? Yeah. yeah. yeah they, Where? They, played in, they stayed in my house. Bob. Uh, on Market Street? Uh, yeah. No, it was... What? For, or it was on Chester. I, I think it was Philbert. Philbert yeah. So... Ooh. Oh, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, was a, that was his own. They got a show through this guy that... By the way... Bobby Wally. By the way, I, so I, have an, I have something to talk to you about, but not now about that. Ooh, okay. okay. All right. We'll save <laughs> um, that for after the show. Uh, don't let me forget. And uh, I won't. Uh, Never forget. <laughs> and then we got a short, uh, show. I got a show with them and, and Denny and Denny Breakfast at um, Berkeley Arts Festival, the venue. Oh, yeah. And... Gamble on X and Gamble on X, on yeah, t- and right, yeah, 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 yeah. Lydia, Lydia, and all those cats for sure. Awesome. I was not on this gig though. I I feel like I would absolutely one hundred percent remember this. Um, right. Well, there's a video of it. Yeah, uh, Bob, you had a big band. I remember yeah. that. Y- usually does. That's how <laughs> I roll. I know. <laughs> um, maybe you had me playing a pan or a vibraphone. There or, were two vibes on that show, I remember. So maybe you were on that show. What? I think Andrew was on it. No, here I you mean, are. It, it I'm, it might I'm, have been... I'm looking at a picture of Mark Clifford playing a pot right now. A pot? Yep. Nailed it. Get to get go get go get go yep. get go. You were yeah. on that gig. <laughs> you did see nice. Pandera. So we've met, man. <laughs> yeah. It's good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you, man. It's been too long, dude. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> wow. Okay. I'm trying to remember that. BAF back in the day. Dude, that, that's wild. So that must have been 2014, 15. I had, I had like just come Dude, out. 2015, here. Out for a couple November of 2015. November 2015. There yeah. you go. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I'd been out for a couple years. That's interesting. Fascinating. So, yeah. So right. we did we did PASIC that year in Texas. That was the impetus for us to like start working together. The PASIC clinic went over really well. We had a lot of interest afterwards. Like, And so we applied to do it again the next year. But uh-huh. with a bigger group, and uh, and we got that as well too. And the way PASIC works is like you apply for these things in <clears throat> January. They tell you in May, and then you go do the actual thing in like October or November or whatever it was. Okay. So like we applied for it as this like we're gonna have. I think we called it like the Brazilian Percussion All Stars <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we didn't know who it was gonna be. Like we know we're gonna bring a group, but we had no idea who it was going to be. Ah. Uh. And so they 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 greenlit it. And then in May, we started reaching out to people, and that became the group PRD Mice yeah. that we play with to this day. You know, And so Such where, a great where are those, uh, the two brothers from, I assume they're brothers, sorry, that's that might be a... The Oliveras, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gustavo yeah. and Guilherme. Gustavo and, and Gil, Gilherme? Guilherme. Guilherme, okay. Do Portuguese pronunciation is a whole other word. Yeah. It's a whole other yeah. word. So wait, yeah. Yeah, yeah. these are... Sorry, I, I I actually don't know all the m- members of PRD Mush. Can you sure just list yeah, them? Yeah, let's go through yeah. it, man. So, so like we were, yeah, we had PRD, we had me, mm-hmm. and then we were just going to like add on from there. And the <clears> idea <throat> that we had, I think that's right. I forgot about this. The year before when we did 2015 PASIC, Ghost Note was playing there. Ghost? And it was like the very first iteration of Ghost Note when they had like five drummers. You know, mm. like I, Ghost Note is a different thing nowadays, I think. But like that first like year or so that they were doing it, that first pacing that we saw them at, they had like three or four drum set players, like two or three percussionists. Oh. Like it was mostly a percussion ensemble with maybe a bass and sax player or something like that. Like Interesting. It, now it's more of a funk band. But like we saw that show. <laughs> and so when we like decided to pitch the next year for this band, that was the idea was like, oh, this is how we add on to PRD. We just add more drums, <laughs> Yeah, you know? And we're just going to build around percussion. We're just going to double down on percussion, you know? And so, like, we got Gustavo and Guilherme, uh, Oliveira. They are from uh, from Tijuca uh, in Rio de Janeiro. The Salguero Samba School is the Samba School they grew up playing in. Their father played in it. I, maybe their grandfather. Like, they have a lineage there. They were born on, like, this one road, and they've lived on the same road, I think, their entire lives up until this point. You know? Okay. Um, they came out of that Samba School, and now they are, like, the mestres of the Bateria. They lead that Samba School. Oh. So, like, yeah. it doesn't get any more rootsy than these two guys. You know, they are, like, 
walking and talking Samba, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then this other guy, Boca Hayes, who is from Bahia, from Salvador, oh. but came down to Rio and was like kind of like the resident, like Bayanu in Rio. Like he was teaching percussion from Bahia there, you know, like the same way Gabriel has that, uh, that group, Batuki Batu, which I, I modeled my Miami Bloco group afterwards, mm -hmm. a Batucada, Brazilian Bloco. He was teaching that for, from the Bahian perspective. So they would play more Samba Hegi and Chimbalado, Olodum style stuff. Yeah. Um, what is, so he on, represented pause. a different voice. What is Olodum? Olodum is a group from uh, Salvador Bahia. Uh, oh, it's a group. That was hugely famous in like the late 80s, early 90s. And like they pioneered along with this other group, Chimbalada, I think also gets credit for it. They they pioneered the sound of, of Samba Hegi. And that style of uh, bloco afro. Oh, okay, drum, I got you. You know, which is it's it. They have hipiki, they have sordos, they have a lot of the same different same style drums, but they're played in completely different techniques yeah. than than Brazilian or than uh, okay. Rio de Janeiro style drums. Brazil's you know? a big place. Yeah. That's the thing about Brazil is that like that place is huge. <laughs> it is like yeah. it, uh, the U.S. is really the best analog we have for it in this. Uh, side of the world just on like size of it but it's different than the u.s and that like i think there's such a strong regionality in the music of brazil my my you know my lazy man's hypothesis on this is that like the u.s had i think radio at an earlier age had like national transmission at an earlier in an earlier time so like we have i think more of a nationally formed sound especially nowadays well, we are the mm -hmm. original globalizers right there so you go, like, exactly. Whereas in Brazil, like uh, all those regions, like like there is a law in, I think when you're in Pernambuco, it's a neighboring state to Bahia. When you're in Pernambuco, you're not allowed to play music from Bahia or styles from Bahia during Carnival. <laughs> and they're like neighboring states, you it's know? It's a good rule. Like, this is a right law? <laughs> yeah, like you just, you're not allowed to do it, you know? Like, so like the regionality there is a, is a very different, different thing entirely. Wow. Know? And so Boca comes from a very different lineage than anybody else in that group does. Like Bernardo, Gabriel, Gustavo Guilherme, they all grew up in Samba schools. They all grew up in Rio, like mm -hmm. they're Rio to the core. Boca is, is a different is a different beast in that group. And then we added uh, Carlos Malta, who is a uh, is the first non percussionist in the group. Even though he plays like a percussionist, he's I mean he's an incredible musician. Like rhythmically, he's just like so solid. He's a woodwind player who came up, I think like his biggest influence on him was Hermeto Pascual. Oh, yes. Yeah. He yeah. played in Hermeto Pascual's group for years and years and years. He lived with a guy. Oh, he, he told us all these stories him? of like, oh yeah, he was in oh, dang, Hermeto Pascual dude. y Grupo for years. I did not him. know that. Okay. He played with Gil. He's played with everybody. Oh, geez. Like, yeah, That's Malta, heavy. Malta is a heavy, heavy cat. Okay. Um, and he was kind of like our musical godfather because Bernardo plays in his group called Pifi Moderno, mm -hmm. which is another like Brazilian like percussion heavy group. <clears throat> it's like four percussionists and two wind players, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right on. So like we were very much modeled after that, you know, he was, he was a big inspiration for us. So we invited him as like the special guest as our guru, you know, like he, he, he he's, he 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 lent us more than just his flute. Like there was a lot of of just like inspiration we garnered from that guy, as far as how to lead a group, how to be musicians, how to be a person. Like that guy is yeah, he is incredible. That dude just will like spark music wherever he's at. I remember because we 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 went to Phil, we went to Indianapolis to to do that basic, and then we went to Philadelphia afterwards. And in Philadelphia, we were recording the album there. We would yeah. go out every night afterwards. One night, like we were out at like a Chinese restaurant in like the downtown area of Philadelphia, at like three in the morning, four in the morning or something like that. Super late night. Malta disappears. He goes to the bathroom and like, all of a sudden you just hear like flute wafting down the hallway. <laughs> yeah. And we turn around and like, Oh no, he's doing it. Like he's, <laughs> he's coming around and he just like popped out from the other side of like this aquarium with his flute and he's just playing it's three in the morning in Philadelphia. Like, this is like Will Ferrell like, on the jazz flute. <laughs> 100% just doing that as far as any American would tell yeah. you know, like that's what he's doing. Yeah. And like, there's all these just 
at the people that you would expect at a at a restaurant at three in the morning in Philadelphia or in this room, yeah. you know, yeah. and like, how are they going to react to this? And he got everybody in that room. Like they were all clapping. They they turned, they started playing with him. Like we started marching around the room <laughs> together. People were picking up bottles and playing. Like what? Everywhere oh, he goes, he does this. Sounds, everywhere he goes, he does this. It's magical, dude. He did that. He did that in New Orleans because uh, he and Bernardo recorded with Snarky Puppy on uh, a family dinner down there. Yeah, and he did the same thing at a bar down there as well too. Like <laughs> it was it was after a Johnny Vidakovich and Charlie Hunter gig. Yeah, like they finished at two or three in the morning, and then Malta just goes, "Vamos fazer um som. <laughs> Let's make sound." And he just pulled his flute out of the sheath on his back like it was like a it's samurai so sword. <laughs> Bam! <laughs> ready to go. And like Bernardo grabs a pandera out of his bag and he hands me a, a triangle and he's like, I don't have a beater. Go find a beater. And I run to the bar. I was like, can I have a knife? And they're like, what for? It's like for this triangle. I'm like, no, you can't have a knife. <laughs> <laughs> and so we just go out and we took over that room as well too. Everywhere he goes, he, he does this sort of stuff. He's a Pied Piper. Like there's no other way to describe it. Yeah, you know? that's incredible. Just music flows out of him. And it's like it's like that with so many of the people in Brazil. And that's why, that's why I fell in love with that place so much. You know, it's... Yeah. The, the the relationship with music on a personal level, I think, is a different thing down there. Yeah. So you you touched on just now going to Rittenhouse and recording <clears> the <throat> record, PRD Mais Rittenhouse, and I have a ton of questions. Um, sure. So maybe we can sort of dive into that. I mean, so the very first thing that will inform the other questions is, the, are the videos that are available the recordings? Like, is that yeah. y'all doing the... Okay, that's insane. <laughs> um, so the next thing is... I haven't is, seen these videos they're oh man they're sick but um, i mean like we 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 would do we would do a shoot and then we would come back and circle around with second cameras as well too you know yeah so like that we had like you know cutaways where like we were doing a playback or that sort of stuff but like the takes were taken from like this one take this other take that's yeah. so yeah. bonkers I mean, yeah so to the listeners i mean you can go check out uh prd mais that's m-a-i-s uh written house mm -hmm. r-i-t-t-e-n house i think yep that's um it. on youtube so all the all the sounds that you hear on this record you watch it being performed which is extremely rare for a record especially with the level of musicianship that's happening it's completely bananas and uh so in terms of composition on this record it's extremely complex music it seems Almost 100% memorized. I think I saw a little sliver yeah. of a piece of paper here or there. But uh, <laughs> yeah. how much were you all practicing before you uh, recorded? It, it's well, just as as a group, none. Like we didn't get to do a full like group rehearsal until Indianapolis. So the the whole conceit behind this was that like we got this basic thing, and we're going to come up and do the Indianapolis stuff. But while we are there, we're going to try and get over to Philadelphia where our friend Jim Hamilton, who was the percussionist for Boys to Men back in the day. Oh, oh wow. He's, okay. He's like an old Philly guy who's, who's, who's steeped in the Brazilian music scene there in Philadelphia. Oh. Good friends with everybody with, within that Brazilian music circle in Rio. Anyway, he had a studio there at Rittenhouse that was like an old, I think it used to be like a car, an auto repair shop or something like that from the turn of the century. He bought and turned it into a giant studio at the time when everybody else was just like downsizing into their little bedrooms. You know? It looks like a massive room for sure. It's huge. And that's the second floor. And there's a bigger room underneath, what? you know, like it's <laughs> massive. Right. This yeah, place. yeah. All right. He, the, the dude had a vision. Yeah. Um, and so, but like he was offering like us to be able to go there and record for free essentially oh and he, and, that is sick that's awesome and he put us up in his in his house and we were like sleeping or we slept in the studio i think some nights like on top of like sound you know soundproofing and shit like that like it was, <laughs> yeah it was madness the way we did it but like that was like that was the whole reason for the trip was like all right indianapolis but really what we're here to do is like shoot these videos. Oh, interesting. And we were thinking like we're going to shoot videos because that's how you get people's attention nowadays. We're just going to make videos for the internet. We weren't even really thinking about making an album at that time. Mm. It was just like, let's just treat these all individually, you know? Interesting. And so beforehand, we had like, I went down there this summer beforehand and we had some writing sessions, you know, like, okay. uh, you know, I, the basically the way we we came up with the compositions for that is that everybody brought their own thing to the group you know and like sometimes like entire pieces were composed by one person sometimes it was like a collaboration between peoples 
Sometimes it was like this part of this piece was written by this guy. This part of this piece was written by this guy. Like it varied, but it came out like super, super naturally, I think. It's it's really amazing to listen to. And we should check out an excerpt. Um, we have a few excerpts lined up, but, uh, awesome. uh, you know, just to let's to hear you play as an ensemble like that. And, and we'll listen. But like I, I it's incredible for me to conceive of a coming up with that material, but to, to hear that it was, um, that people contributed what they had to offer that actually clarifies some of the things that we're going to get to as well, especially with the brothers, like some of the, yeah. like one of their shining moments. I was like, yeah. oh, okay, that makes more sense. But anyway, that's what they yeah, do. Let, you know, like we didn't write them for that. Like those guys oh, well, came I, with that already. Yeah. <laughs> but the <laughs> fact that I, you can watch that being performed live, like that's, you, you know, like, like I think about like uh, soul percussion, like uh, David Lang's The So-Called Laws uh -huh. of Nature, these extremely complex pieces that I've seen performed by modern percussion ensembles, which I have utmost respect for. Uh -huh. You know, I love that. I love them. I love that music. But, dude, y'all just, just kind of just do some stuff that I think it would take years for other cats to to be able to achieve on that level, <laughs> yeah. and it just seems like these, you these just kind of have... came together. And I don't know, but it did take uh, years. I mean, they've been doing yeah, that their whole life. I mean, because it took their entire life. That's what I was going to say. You know, like is it, like it, it that comes from their entire life of being in that in that world of music and like speaking that same language, and like uh, you know, my, my, my job in that group, everybody's job in that group really was to like bring their strength to the group. And like, and, and find, find your own place to fit in, find your own place <clears throat> to work within that group, you know, because we have, you know, just from the percussion section of the group, the, the meat and potatoes of the PRD mice, the six of us. Yeah. That's a lot of hands. And so for yeah. most music, you, everybody can play something like really simplistic within it. And it becomes much more about like layering and communication and conversation than it does individual chops. Although there are moments like, you know, the Oliveira moments and, yeah. You know, I, and Gabrielle has several of those, Bernardo, Boca, they all do, of just incredible virtuosity. Yeah. A lot of it is more about, like, it's, it's music it's, making. Yeah, and that's really cool because it's a band, <laughs> yeah, you know? Exactly. It's like y'all came be. together and made a band. But, yeah, yeah. And it's really cool that, that cool. everyone gets these moments where they get to, there There are features and there's yep. really, really deep groups. Let's listen to some. Yeah. This is uh, Tico Taco with so this uh, can would be we do, Bernardo can we start and, uh, with Baile Nan Uh yeah. yeah. So this is, this is just a, so this has you on Pandero as as yeah. well. Okay, cool. <laughs> Double Pandero. Double, Double Pandero, Pandero baby. Can Rock and roll it? baby. Yeah, yeah, here we go. start with just do you, what does the title mean Bailey uh is, is dance and there's a uh there's a style of of music called Bailey funky mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh which is um also known as bachi down which is like a a new like hip-hop kind of style of music that came out of out of brazil out of rio especially in the early 2000s so it's referencing that a lot of the rhythms that we're playing yeah. are like referencing that kind of feel and na and goma Na means in the, and ngoma means, I think it's a, ban, a Bantu word, Bantu word for drum. It's originally an African word. Oh. Or ngoma oh. means drum. That's interesting. So dance on the drum. You know? <laughs> and so, I, I mean, like, it, 
The, I think for sure, like the, the big focus is that first word bylead because so much of what we do in this tune is like, is affecting the sounds of things and trying to achieve things that are a little bit more electronic sounding, you know, yeah. the, the pitch bend stuff that he has on the Pandero, the, the Cuica uh, at the beginning, like that, that's a, a, you know, Gustavo and Guilherme become like one person at that point because Gustavo was playing the Cuica and Guilherme is affecting the sound, you know, yeah. he's, he's DJing at that point, you know, like, um, so you guys were cool. doing the effects live. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Exactly. Yeah. So they, they have all that stuff. So when we do it live, that's how it comes out as well too. You know, like you'll see like he's over there twisting knobs on that part. <laughs> yeah. God, I, uh, I wish I had so seen these freaking videos. I haven't seen them. Jesus, <laughs> Bob, how can you not watch my band's videos? Well, I just didn't know they existed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read your, was, I read your, uh, your um dissertation but i didn't know you had videos on youtube you read my <laughs> dissertation but you did that's a true friend if you read my like 100 page paper on the tambourine you're a true friend <laughs> yeah I, well uh, well i i had a question about this it um just about the pandero playing on this uh so what it looked like is that bernardo had a massive microphone and um and you had like the the mounted acoustic one did you both have that because like i i know from reading the the bit that i did i didn't read your entire dissertation i'm That's so sorry okay, please my <laughs> <laughs> but from what i did is is talking about how uh marco susano one of the big revolutions that he created mm -hmm. in pandero plane is mounting the microphone on there so that you can do more work with uh getting tuning the bass tones and getting with, those with getting a lower frequency is really what it is because like okay. the <laughs> traditional panderos um are tuned up like really high you know yeah. because when you play them acoustically in order for them to speak within a group they have to be cranked up to a certain point if they're too low they just don't sound in the room enough you know and so like uh there were people playing panderos into microphones before Susano for sure you know uh maybe a, f a few who were attaching them a lot of them just playing over one that's on a pedestal but the tuning was always like the natural acoustic tuning. Yeah. He was the first one to figure out, all right, if I detune this thing and I put it like right up close on this microphone and I use the you know, the proximity effect from this, I'm going to get this massive bass response out of this thing yeah. that you wouldn't normally hear on the drum unless you put your ear right there, you know? Yeah. Interesting. And so th that revolutionized the instrument for sure, you know? Like that, that made it into a very different, uh, different thing. And so what Bernardo is doing there is he's doing a lot of like pitch shifting. And the reason you get all that range is because the drum is detuned. If it's up high, it's tighter. So you can't affect the tuning as much, you know? So is, does Bernardo use a mounted microphone as well, as yeah. well as that big old, that like that big, like massive Nalgene looking can that was underneath? The, <laughs> I have to, a, I'd have to watch the video game to see what he used there because I'm pretty sure that because we were recording a video, we were doing it like a live performance, that he had a microphone on there. Maybe he had a second one there for, generally speaking, you use the microphone, and he does as well too, use the mounted microphone uh -huh. for live performance. Okay. And you don't use it for recording so much because you get all this extra frame noise, you know? It's mm. Because the, the microphone is mounted on the frame. Every time you contact the frame, you get the resonance of the bass in there. So it tends to be a little bit more rumbly than if you're playing on a microphone that's not mounted to the drum. I see. So like when I record at home, I, I, I don't use the mounted microphone, you know? Yeah. I, I think in that video we were both using mounted microphones, but maybe he had a second one on there as well too because he was using the pedal. We might have done some different oh, things. Oh, yeah. It was mm. being affected for live. That that's record. right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So we might have had two streams because of that. Okay. Um, so I have a question about this technique that gets used in this song, um, and other places on the record as well, but on the hippie where Bernardo's going, <laughs> is that Gabrielle, but yeah. Oh yeah. Gabrielle. Is that a technique that you guys invented? Uh, um, I mean, Gabrielle, I will say like much in the same way that Susano, like revolutionized the way that you play that instrument, Bandero. Gabriel has really revolutionized the way other people play <laughs> Hippiki within Brazil. Like he, it, I mean, you know, he, he won't say it, but that dude is a reference yeah. for a whole generation of people underneath him that all aspire to be this guy. He's got his own like, 
you know, signature hippie through Contemporanea there that was designed by him. Oh, really? And, uh, it, yeah. Where like they lowered the rim so that you can play the left hand without like hitting the rim on your left hand. That was an invention that he created, I think, with his dad. Whoa. Like they just did that at the workshop. And so like he has a lot of things in his playing technique as well, too, that are like really inventions by him where he's like shifting the pitch yep. of that, where he goes, zzz, yep. zzz, 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 zzz. that thing, that I think that's Gabriel. I've never seen other people do it yeah. before him, you know. That's um, such a uh, cool thing. It's so funky. <laughs> yeah. Dude, he makes that thing talk. I, I, yeah. he's, he's the most natural musician I think I've ever been around, you know. Like everything just flows from that guy so effortlessly. And he plays so dynamically. That is the thing that like differentiates him from any other hippie player that I know, because the hippie is an instrument that's made to play loud. Yeah, like mm. you're supposed to be with like 300 other dudes. Like that's what it's for, you know. And Gabriel has this whole vocabulary of stuff that he does, like in the you know pianissimo to mezzo piano dynamic range. Yeah, yeah. That I think sets him apart from anybody else, and that's why he can like. He can play in groups like this, and that's why we can have a group with six percussionists and it doesn't sound muddled, you know, because everybody's taking their space, taking their spot. Yeah. Interesting. He's so, so good at that. So he's got that. He's got, like, playing on the side and, like, the the like going around the edge of the drum, playing on, like, the tension rods of the drum. A lot of that stuff, I think, is really is, is him. Although he, he, he may tell you otherwise, you know. That, that's the thing about these traditions and these drums is there are these landmark guys that we remember and that have you know, were recorded and da, 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 but then there's all these anonymous players over the years right because that culture is so big yeah but you can't really quantify like the influence that they had interesting on that, you know yeah so i hesitate to say anybody invented anything in this sure in this style but like yeah but totally. that's definitely a that's uh that's a, a signature move of his for sure yeah um so something that's really interesting that you bring to the group is the xylosynth. Um, mm. And I love, you know, it, are you, you're patching in sounds, you're running it through your computer and controlling the sounds on there generally. But the, the, the general, um, the sounds, the timbre and everything that you choose works really well in the context, like a little bit of delay, Thank you know you, what man. I mean? And um, I, I really, I really loved what that adds to the group and, oh, you know, just like nice groove, nice chord progressions. And, um, yeah, it's cool. So, it's not something that I would have thought of, you know, <laughs> and, and like, I mean, it works really well in a, in, in like kind of left field. Like before I had seen any of the videos, I was just listening to the record and I was like, Whoa, okay. So there's something else happening here. Yeah, you know, like track two, like portal. As soon as you hear yeah. that, you're like, okay, cool. So th this is, there's, there's something else. There's something, something deeper here <laughs> in that. Not, not deeper. I mean, everything is so no. deep already. What's going on with all those musicians, but it's, it's a very cool element. And I, I think maybe we can play, maybe portal would be a good excerpt. Sure. Sure. Yeah, okay. Portal. This is, port this is uh, excerpt from portal. Now th this one, I actually, I'll correct, correct your pronunciation. I call it portal, not because of any, Portuguese thing, oh. but because I lived in the neighborhood of El Portal oh, in gotcha. Miami when Portal. I was okay. when I wrote this thing. Duly Portal. noted. <laughs> <laughs> Instrument called there that's playing is the like conga what? thing. The conga thing. What is this instrument? Oh, chimbao. Chimbao. chimbao sorry. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chimbao. That that's from Salvador. You know, that's Boca. 
is, is playing that one. And that's very much a like buy in instrument. So yeah. in like, in a song like this, um, is it led like the transition that we hear here from this dig on gunk, dig on gunk thing to the mm-hmm. other chord progression? Is that change called by the chimbao? Uh, n- I think we have that one kind of fixed. Oh, okay. Like we don't really usually sit in that one. Any, like this tune, I think is like, you know, for lack of a better term, this is our, our pop hit. This is our little <laughs> single kind of thing. You okay. know, like Because it, it, it like, it's very just like self-enclosed. Like there's this kind of form to it. We don't like do like big solos or anything on it. And that was super intentional. And yeah. like, I, I think like you actually hit on it earlier when you were talking about it, Mark, like, Putting that as a second track changes your perspective of what this album is going to be. Well, yeah, because the first track is just Bernardo and Gabrielle, like, right? It's just it's duo. It's super strong. You're like, where's and then, the mic? And then you immediately, yeah, it, it, you immediately go and you hear this instrument. Next thing, mm-hmm. you're like, all right, this is different. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. I, because the conceit of the group is that PRD Santra Pandera Hippiki duo. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's based on the their duo, their writing style. They always kind of wrote like this. They write in this sense of that they call melody of <laughs> rhythm, like these long phrases that that constitute a melody, but don't don't necessarily have pitches. That kind of stuff. So it's like based on their duo, and then mice means more. So we added to it, right? You're right. Um, and so I think we really wanted to in the second track in particular, like say, like all right, this is a this is not just a standard batucada like ensemble. There's not just a standard block of word. This is a different thing. This is a band, you know? Yeah. And so it was, it was very intentional to, to make that one separate. It's not, and that, that section isn't really called so much by the, the Chimbao and the way this tune worked. It's like, I just came up with that, that chord, that initial chord progression, I think down at, at Richard's house, so like banging out on the roads. Yeah. And like, then I, I had that in some kind of a six eight groove. They the groove that they were inspired by is actually a North African groove, and they kind of like took that structure and did something different around it. That second section, like that digo coco digo coco digo, in my head, that's totally like that's marimba repertoire. <laughs> that's that marimba thing that you do where you play the melody in the right hand on the beat, and then you fill in all the off beats in your left hand, so it gives a sense of harmony underneath. Mm-hmm. You yes. know. And like it fills everything out in like the the biggest way that you can with this instrument, and like that's what I was trying to do because it's just it's just me and everybody else, you know. Like so, I have to sound as full as I can, but at the same time, like because there's so many other things happening and there's so much like ear candy and the groove that's going on, I just have to be kind of the skeleton, yeah, and hold but, it yeah, together. So it, you know. it worked. It works extremely well. It's very very cool, and um, it's you know right. It tickles something very particular for me, you <laughs> yeah, know, because yeah. like the, the 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 closest analog coming up for me of the, like for this is like tortoise, where they have that that bugla marimba synth that they carry around with them all right. the time, and they have a couple of vibraphones on stage and all that. So I would like get totally geeked by that. But this is um, the musicianship in this band is just beyond anything that I've you know. It's it's ridiculous, but anyway. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. Yeah. And <laughs> so, like, right after you make the change in this part, in the drums, there's mm-hmm. this kind of, like, quick flurry of things that go around where it's, like, one person kind of, I forget who starts it, but it's, like, you hear something here, and then it's you hear it over here, and it's, like... Yeah, entrances are super important. So, but this is all, like, mm. uh, I have to imagine that that's improvised, right? It's, like... No, no, it's not at all. No, it, it really comes from <laughs> uh, the the samba school way of thinking. Like, all right. So, for example, okay. when you when you start, can we just play it like, again, uh, real quick? Just that bit. Sure. Totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> about that that, that stuff yeah well it's like yeah, that's that's Gabrielle, right? and then yeah that's i mean like there's what's not really being improvised is like the fact that we're going to trade here but like some of those notes in between like gabriel really that that's gabriel that's the hippie now that that you mentioned i was listening to it earlier we were saying chibal i'm sorry that's wrong. well isn't it a chibal that calls it or is it i'm pretty sure that, 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 that i'm pretty sure that's hippie oh, okay though. 
going mm-hmm. into it. Mm. I think there's a close up of him if I remember correctly. Um, but like, yeah, like there's there's going to be a conversation between Gabrielle and and I think it might be Gustavo at the, or Guilherme at that point. But like, you you hear like halfway into it, you hear ding 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 like an entrance of like of the frigidera, which is like that frying pan, and it doesn't come in right away. That's what I'm talking about as being like very much from the samba school thing. And same with the hippiki because the hippiki, you know, in that in that style has freedom, especially as a hippiki soloist, to like comment on what's going on and play some things around the group. Oh, okay, you know? gotcha. But at the same time, it's not supposed to be like a big open hippiki f- feature where he just like knocks everybody's socks off. It's just like a little commentary no, but the, here and there. The, so like, but I'm just, what I'm trying to ask about is I guess the communication between the drummers in this part. Because like mm-hmm. the hippiki says something and then someone else, I don't know who, what instrument it was, says something else and then it goes back to the hippiki. Play it again one more time. I'll just, uh, here, I'll move it forward. Look at that. Yeah, thing. what is that? That's Jimbao. Now, but he's just doing a part there. Like he's playing a groove and that just pops out. Oh, okay. In that one That's moment. That's a part, huh? But like that, that is so much a thing about Brazilian percussion and like in that, like when you're, soloing in that style um and and the way that he plays for sure there's always this great use of space not to just like not to just like break up his phrases but also highlight other things that are happening within the group you know yeah yeah there are spots where if you take a rest here it's going to highlight something different than if you take a rest over here you exactly know? yeah now that stuff i think is intentional for sure bob you're trying to find instances where there could be calls um and section changes well, yeah, that way. I, I'm just curious about the the interaction of the drums, like how it how it works, because you know, mm-hmm. it, it it's always fascinating to me. You know, being uh, studying Afro-Cuban percussion so heavily, and like how mm-hmm. much of a just completely foreign world Brazilian music seems like to me. It's like, yeah, and ostensibly it's from the it's same stuff. Thing. Ostensibly, I mean, you know, there, yeah, there's like a lot of the main ingredients are the same, all the Yoruba influence, all that. But like, um, the the way it manifested for sure is very different, and the way the drums talk with each other, for sure, is very different. Although, you know, in the same way that you have in the Afro-Cuban world, there are there are rules for how the drums kind of talk with each other. So I think like in Portal there is a little bit of this, but Portal is very much like fixed. Bailing on Goma is that's one that we like stretch out when we do it live and we do different things when we do that one live because okay. that one is very much relying on this kind of thing that you're alluding to the idea of like, all right, this guy calls this section, this guy calls this section. Oh, okay. You know, cool. So, like that, that tune, uh, there's another one, Batallon, that's just like samba percussion. I don't think I, I wasn't on the recording of that one, even though I do it live with him, but like. That's another one that's like very much based on this like logic and method of samba drumming, of batucada style drumming, where like everybody has a role within the group. Generally speaking, the hepiki is the leader of this and is the one doing a lot of the calls and and connecting things together. Um, But that responsibility can be passed to other guys, you know. Yeah. So like in in Bataya, for example, there's a section where it breaks down and it's just Sordo and Tamborim. And it's the two Oliveira brothers playing together and like they have their own little freak out section there and they just go nuts, you know? And that's just open. They'll do it as long as they want. And then at some point in that one, you'll hear but and then it just goes from there. And everyone's in. You're talking about a everyone's song in that's in not on called. the album or is on? But, no, Bataya. B A T A L. So actually, I think I think it's called Cabuleto Batalha. Oh, okay, wait, record. wait, no. So I have Cabuleto and Batalha to Bosan Bosanta. Yeah, Bosanta, because that that's one of those tunes where it's like they they it was cobbled together. Cabuleto is like a a hippiki and chimbao duo okay. that Gabriel and Boca wrote together. Yeah, Batalha, which is like the 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 bulk of the tune, I think. Is 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 really from Gabriel's group Batuki Batu, 
which is a, a like batucada, just, you know, karaoke, samba style drumming group. Karaoke? That that composition kind of comes out of there. And then Bosanta, I think, is is like that that section that I'm just talking about now where it's just the two of them. The uh, their, their full name is Oliveira dos Santos. Oh. So Bosanto is referring to that other... Brazilians have tons of names. I, I don't I don't know if it's the exact same in Cuba as well too, but like Brazilians, like everybody's got four or five names, something like that. No, yeah. You know. Not I mean, it can be that way, but to the point that I picked up an extra name by being down there just from hanging around those people. <laughs> what's your what's what your bonus it? name? My bonus name is Ubira Jara. Oh Ubira Pot. Oh, gotcha. If you, if you see my Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's why it's that. I didn't just fall on the keyboard and then type <laughs> pots afterwards. Like that's that's a name. Yeah. Um and like and that that name is super special to me because it's it was it was it was given to me. Is there. that related like, to went, Borabira, the title? Yes. Uh, yeah. Putting Bora it together. Bira is let's go Bira. So Ubira Jara Ubira Jara is a long version of the name and the short version of it, you know, the Bob to the Robert is Bira. Gotcha. You know? And Bira is B I R A, like it's it's close by. I, I remember when I was down there for years and years, people would just call me Brian, and it's like it's a hard word for people to say, like it just doesn't roll off the Brazilian tongue all that well. Yeah. yeah. And we were in Hesifi for Carnival with this guy Amaro. Amaro is just a saint of a human being. He's incredible. He's he's this like cultural um compiler within Hesifi. Like he works with a bunch of artists there, does documentaries, is an incredible dude. But famously doesn't really care for Americans too much. And like <laughs> for, you know, for there are plenty of reasons that a lot of South Americans don't care for for United States people. And eh, I get it as well. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he famously like did not care for Americans. I remember Bernardo introduced me to him. He told me that. He's like, just, you know, just know he'll calm down, he'll relax. I went over to this guy's house and I walked into his living room and he instead of a sofa, he had a hammock in the living room. And I'm like, seems chill. I'm going to be this guy's best friend. Yeah. Like, there's no way that we're not going to get yeah. along. Like, if he's got a hammock in the living room, that's my people. Like, I can I can get down with that. So, like, we started hanging out and drinking beers. And, and, like, and then we got to be, like, really good friends. And within, like, a day, he was just, like, all over me. He loved me. Cool. And so we're walking to uh, to Hasifi at night for Carnival. And they're talking about this problem with my name. Brian doesn't really work. You know, we need to give a Portuguese name. And Amaro goes, Bira. Like, obviously. It's Bira. It's been sitting there this entire time, and the idiots didn't just pick it up because it it looks like Brian. It fits. And so then they said, "All right, so you can either choose Bira is short for other names. You can either be Ubira C, Ubira Tan, or Ubira Jara." Huh? And Ubira Jara has a B and a J in it, which Bob will probably remember that for the first eighteen uh... years of my life, I went by B J Potts. Well. Hell's bells, man. <laughs> my parents named me. My parents named me after a character on Mash, <laughs> BJ oh. Honeycut, because they're obsessed with that show, Mash. <laughs> oh, and wow. they just filled okay. in the names Brian and James. Brian's my dad's middle name. James is my uncle's name. This is it. Yeah, all I comes back. And so, like when they gave me that choice, I was like, oh, obviously, yeah, it's got to be Ubira Jada. So Bora Bira is a reference to that. Let's go Bira. Because you know, I I'm usually the the one who's the most late to things in the group. Really? Oh, really? <laughs> so yeah. So I've got the song named after me. What a beer. Let's go. That's fascinating. Well, let's do that excerpt then. Um, I love that you're the latest one in the group. That's freaking I know. hilarious. That's, that's pretty funny, man. That's pretty funny. I've been in Miami for over half my life at this point. You know, yeah. the clock is different down here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I love how metal this starts off. Yeah. Oh yeah, it is very Let's metal. hit it. Let's hit it. <laughs>
So, okay, a couple questions. First off, mm-hmm. what kind of flute are we talking about here? What kind of flute? Yeah, is this are we a normal about? flute? Uh, I think maybe in the beginning of that tune, he's on piccolo. Okay. And then he, and I think that entrance might be on. Are you, are you watching the video? No, I I haven't seen oh, okay. the video, I which I guess would answer some of these questions. But uh, but I to be fair, our he, listeners he, he are not watching flutes. the video right now. They're listening to us That's talk. That's a very good point. So. <laughs> That's a very good point. So that that first one, I'm pretty sure is is a piccolo that he starts with, and then he goes to a flute for that for that main section. Okay. Like just a regular standard C flute. And then I think later on in this tune, he goes to Pifi at some point. So there's a Brazilian version of the flute. Fife? A, a, Pife? a version of the fife. Fife. Yeah, Pife. Pife, Pife like translates to fife. You yeah, know? yeah. We have like fife and drum music, you know? Yes. Um, which which I need to check out. You were talking about that. Uh, the Mississippi North Mississippi fife, fife and, and drum music. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's it. Not to derail, but... We could do a whole I'm, other two hours on that one. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> um, but the uh, the fife in Brazil, pife in Brazil, is hugely important to especially the northeastern region, uh, the sertão of Brazil, um, where you have like this tradition of like of banda de pifano, where you have like you know three or four flute players, a bass drum, snare drum player, a cymbal player. And like they have this whole other style of playing that like clearly comes from the European marching bands. That's where all of those instruments come from, but it's played very differently, you know. So I think he might use the pife in, in this tune as well too. Mm. But the, but compositionally speaking, this one has a very good and easy story to tell. So the the beginning of that tune mm-hmm. is based on the track that happens before it. Vivo, think, right? Vivo, Vivo, Vivo Grilo, the cricket, something, yeah. right? Yeah, a cricket. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. It. Vivo Grilu. Grilu is um, it means cricket, and it was a nickname of the Oliveira's father. Oh, ah. uh, and so that was like made an homage to them. He passed away. He passed away actually. I think like on that on that trip. Like it was it was it was a tough time. And so like they 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 made that piece as like an homage to to him. Um, and if you listen to the very beginning of that tune, can you go, can you go play? I was like, actually going to play this up? whole song because I think it's ridiculous and it's not that long. Viva Viva this, okay, play it, play it. Yeah. The, so can we just set it up real quick? It's, sure. it's, uh, Gil, sorry, man, Gil, Guilherme and Gustavo Oliveira. Guilherme and Gustavo Oliveira. And if you listen to the, like the phrase that this phrase happens, that phrase comes back. In Bora Bira with the melody on top of gotcha. it. Gotcha. And th- this is them on duo tambourines. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, this, is, this is crazy. Just, yeah. I mean, yeah. this is one of the craziest pieces of musicianship I've ever my, heard. So, and yeah, it's, let's yeah, listen yeah. to it. My, my notes on this say, How the fucking fuck do you fucking play this? <laughs> <laughs> especially especially if you see the video of it because the tambourim is a is a one-handed instrument like it's, it's going it's back fu- to that brazilian it's thing fucked. it's so crazy <laughs> you know like the technique is ridiculous so watch the video go ahead okay. play it
uh yep that's crazy <laughs> yeah it's sick. um it's, it's amazing uh yeah i i'm just uh, that is just crazy that that did it the how do they do the six tuplet thing like uh magic magic and no, wizardry what, what is, I, I, what is I literally the technique there it's like da, 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 so, da, like two it's it's like washing your hands you know like like tambourine stuff and like new orleans that kind of thing where like contrary motion no but is it are That's, they going like up up down like or down down up for the triplet yeah. one, I think they're going da 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 da. I think Straight they're just going back and, back and forth. There's different combinations. You know, there's a combination like the the, the basic cajetero pattern, which is like that groove that they sit on. Yeah. That basic pattern is two downstrokes, one upstroke, and another downstroke. But you can also do da 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 They do that as well too, right? Where they do two two one two two one two two one. Yeah. But when they do the six templates, I'm pretty sure they just go back and forth. But it's it's a wizard of an instrument. It's such a crazy thing that I I it that instrument is does better than any other one. Like just like the the job of just kind of like encapsulating the genius of Brazilian percussion, I think more than anything else. Yeah. Interesting. Be Cause it's one little drum. It's this tiny little like six inch drum. Yeah. It looks like it should do nothing. <laughs> it looks like it should just be like in like a, like a kindergarten classroom or something for <laughs> a kid to just, just set on. your coffee down yeah, on and there. It, and it's just like you're, you're holding, you're holding the drum with one hand and you have a stick in the other. And that's. And how much can you, can you expect to do other than bat, 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 bat. <laughs> <laughs> but like that technique they have of going back and forth where like you play through the drum and then come back this way and you hit it both ways, that allows them to create these like more complex and fast rhythms and all that sort of stuff. And what these and guys as they're do going is down, they're hitting rebounds. Ta cut. Like yeah, they're, they're, they're doing they're, one, two, and then on the way back. It's up, really like they catch two it on the other side. Four four notes out of two strokes, basically. Four notes out of three strokes, I think, really, right? One E and a. Uh, well, right? if it's one so E. So down, down, and... up, down, down. Okay. So your right hand really is just going down, 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 down. Yeah, but like those first two, like the second one is like kind of a bounce. It, you know, no, the wrist. It's all a wrist? Yeah, those are wrists. That's another thing about Brazilian percussion that I've learned so much is that like you don't ever try and bounce anything. Really? Just squeeze onto the stick and like wrist it out. Interesting. For real. Yeah. A lot of like the hippiki stuff is very much like that. It's not like there isn't finger being used. Like, and it's not like there isn't bounce being used for sure. But the, the, like where the technique kind of comes from, where the voice speaks from for the easiest, I think is in my experience of it anyway, is from the wrist. Damn. Oh, know? wow. Okay. Okay. So with that in um, mind, let's hear this one more time. Sure. There's one hand. Uh, There's one that's hand. That's crazy, man. <laughs> that's just insane. One more time. One more time. This. <laughs> Nasty. And yep. they're playing it at the same time together clean. Exactly. Like, come clean. on, man. And there's an clean. accent at the end of it. It's like, yep. dude, it's like there's dynamic flow to that passage. Mm. Exactly. <laughs> like there's a crescendo. <laughs> I like how you control that is is beyond me. I, I'm never gonna get to that level. As those guys are wizards in that, and that and that's a that's a thing about the group that was very intentional as well too. Gabriel is a monster hippie player. That's his area. Bernard is a monster pandero player. That's his area. So everybody else has to kind of like find other spaces to fit around within that. You yeah. Know? And maybe the tambourim isn't always thought of as like the leader of the group or whatever. But like. If you are really good at that instrument, like these guys are, you can make it talk. Yeah, in a in a really incredible way, and those guys certainly can. You know, they they are virtuosos in that. Instrument. Yeah, they're talking just fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the end of that one, sagat dagat kat 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 dagat dagat kat 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 dagat dagat kat. Yeah, that came, I think, from I think that's a Salguero call uh, that I think probably they wrote and then like taught to that samba school. But like it comes from a certain year. This is the, the thing about the way the the uh, samba schools work is that every year you write a whole new series of calls and figures to go with that year's samba and hato, that year's theme, that year's song. Oh, you know? interesting. Oh, yeah. 
And so like you can just reference like, all right, let's play, you know, the tambourine phrase from Salguero 2014. We're going to play the Hipiki solo from Villa Isabel 2017. You know, like everything is done by year. And so like they had just done that one like the year before we got together. And so when we were just kind of like assembling ideas for the group, like what are we going to do with these people? They were like, oh, well, we have this phrase and this kind of like little solo that we that we worked around this phrase. So Bernardo and I sat down with that phrase and just kind of like poked out notes around it mm. and to make a tune out of it. So you, you, know? you and then you it, wrote those notes partially. I wrote those notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like on like awesome. a little MIDI keyboard playing them in, you know, like. But it was based around the rhythmic information that was already given to me and by those guys, you know. Yeah, but that's amazing collaboration too. You know, Ooh, like yeah. I, like I was saying earlier, the idea of it being a, a band like that. Where, yeah. And as you were saying, everyone bringing their strong suit. And um, to have that amount of virtuosity within a band, but still have it feel like an ensemble and not like a um, flashy super group, you know, yeah. it's it's pretty it's pretty sweet. But anyway, did, carry on, Bob. Did I'm you sorry, play man. in bands in high school, like rock bands? Rock bands, no, man. Like I played like my extracurricular stuff, like uh, outside was like mostly playing in, in like jazz bands at other community colleges, that sort of stuff. You know, like I played drum set with them. The only, the only, actually the only like rock stuff I think I did in high school was with St. Vincent. What? When, when she was only, when she was other, otherwise known as Annie Clark. Yeah. We went to high school together. She was like a, I think we were the same year. Yeah. And like she played in talent shows and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I think I played like one or two gigs with her, like subbing for her drummer or something like you that. You know she's like, famous now, right? Very sparse. <laughs> this is what I hear. I hear that she's very famous. I, I I heard that. I heard that from from Rajan Purcell like 15 years ago or something like that. Like he 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 I was at his house and he was like, You gotta check out this this girl, St. Vincent. And I picked it up and I was like, Annie? Why do you know Annie? <laughs> <laughs> Annie? <laughs> Yeah, that's but funny, no, man. it wasn't. It was not like a big, big part of my um, of my uh, upbringing. I don't know, man. Like most of the stuff that I was doing in high school was centered around the youth orchestra. Well, I guess it was really centered around three places: the youth orchestra, the um, uh, you know, marching band, and that sort of stuff, and then screwing around recording with uh, with my buddy Michael Catarosano, who was a percussionist. Mitch. Uh, in the youth orchestra as well too, Mitch. Yeah. You know him better as Mitch because that's what I named him. <laughs> but like we would, we would go and like you know record ourselves like playing like just the two of us with like marimba and vibraphone and like playing in drum set parts and that sort of stuff. And like we, you know, we we would we would do things creatively within our own group. But it was not the same as like what you had. Like this is my band. But that, and we've done shows. That, and that little sort of recording bit is pretty important. Like you're recording a lot these days, yeah. Yeah, totally. I and 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 I learned a lot from I do it. I learned a lot from from working with him, but I also learned a lot from like living and working with you as well too, you know. Yeah, as I'm like, like forcing I, you I, to I do stuff at all hours. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it was it was incredible. Mark, have you ever lived with Bob Ledoux? No, but I've um <laughs> You've I've been, been around it enough. In You've proximity seen this in and I've yeah. I've been privy to uh, the energy and, you know, we work together as much as we, we can. So I can only, you know, I, I can imagine and I, I can relate. 20 year old Bob Ledoux was, was oh, a man. different thing. Well, that would be a whole other thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? 20 year old Bob Ledoux was like delivering subs on his bike, oh, like yeah. in 95 degree weather in Miami. Getting rained on <laughs> every day. Home. Rained on every day, just sweaty, <laughs> covered in like water. And he'd come in and he wouldn't even like take a shower. He would just sit down at the computer and start recording. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, I mean, that checks out. I mean, I've, I've often wondered what the workflow looks like, like for him. That um, checks out. He still the, smells all the time. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's currently drenched in water. Like he's soaking wet for this entire recording. No, no but you know, I, um, I have always admired Bob's uh, work ethic and output, you know, and yeah. that, that comes for a reason. Yeah, you know, totally. like that's only going to happen if you, if you are dedicated to that. So that makes sense. You yeah. Know what and, I mean? and he lived it all the time. And so like, I, I got a lot of experience yeah, just being around you and like ha having to constantly record things, you know, and like you would just throw anything at me to do. And it was just like, okay, let's try this. Let's try this. Let's try this. And that totally broke down 
like any fear I had of like being in recording sessions. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like that, that was not in the curriculum at UM that we went through, but we all got a ton of it because we would like, remember that reggae group that we were in? Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, like that Brinks politics, whatever it was. Like we would go and record at the studio there at like three in the morning or something, that sort of stuff. And like we were yeah, just that's... constantly trying. Well, all things. the sessions had to be like, super odd hours because that's when they were available dude but that was perfect so like all like the you sessions couldn't were design like to you couldn't design anything better yeah. than that you couldn't design anything better than that for musicians for college students than to say here you have a free studio all night long yeah yeah you know good. yeah it's amazing it would have been nice if it was get... free during the day sometimes <laughs> <laughs> i would have um, liked that too well, yeah, on on the recording tip, are is PRD mice looking at um, PRD mucho mice? Yeah, PRD. you gonna <laughs> are you gonna mice, any plans mice. for getting back together, touring, recording totally, now that things totally. are opening back up, or what's what's the vibe and the look? Yeah, you know, I I mean, obviously the world is in a complicated place right now, and um and mm -hmm. it's it's complicated <laughs> here and it's complicated in Brazil for sure. Um, oh yeah, things yeah, are getting better. It's... They are they're behind on the vaccines, but they will I think rapidly catch up because it seems like the uh, the anti vaxxer strain that we have here in the U.S. is not as strong in Brazil, and I feel like there's going to oh, be oh good. I'm glad to hear I'm that, man. Anyway, it's, we don't need to get into all that, but it's uh, yeah, but, silly, dark, and stupid. Exactly. But, anyway. but these are the things that are holding us up from from getting back together. And so uh, I think we'll be able to get back together probably within the next few months, hopefully. Maybe I can get down there in December. We can do some more shows. But in the interim, we have been super active. You know, we've, we we recorded a film score. Oh, nice. Whoa. For a, a pre-existing film, a silent film from the 1920s. Nosferatu? <laughs> no, that was one of the ones we could have chosen from. So, so our our label, um, Ground Up Music, which is uh, yeah. the label founded by Snarky Puppy, they're the ones that signed us and support us and all this sort of stuff. They came to us during the middle of the pandemic, saying like we have this uh, partnership with uh, a group called Alamo Draft House, and they're they're hiring us essentially like to do film scores for silent films that they will then be able to sell online and, you know, screen in theaters and all that kind of stuff. That's cool. Yeah. So we had to like just go through all of these old silent films and try and find something that would work for us, you know, which is yeah. a weird ask, like, for, you know, for a Brazilian percussion group from, from, you know, the 2010s to like do something from 110 years ago. <laughs> and I think yeah. it was a German film nonetheless uh, called Waxworks. That's about like a... Um, it's it's about a wax museum in Germany, and like the pretense behind this is that they're looking for a writer to write stories about their wax figures so that they can get more foot traffic. And so this guy goes in, and there's three wax figures. One of them is like a uh, like a Persian king. Another one is Ivan the Terrible, and uh, the last one is Jack the Ripper, actually. Huh. And so there's three like little stories within the film about each of these individuals. So they're all set in different times and different places that gave us a lot of freedom to do that. And so like we did like a big pandemic style recording for all this sort of stuff. Oh, cool. Um, and it's, it's like an hour and 20 minutes of just through composed music. There's no dialogue, no nothing, you know, that's cool. It was, yeah. so is that, is that, that done? Like a really fun project. Sorry, is that is that Go done? Ahead. That's done. That should be coming out in like, uh, I think November, December or something like that. They're waiting because they want to be able to do it like where they can live perform some of the stuff in New York at their flagship theater. Oh. But, you know, we'll see when that happens. That would um, be dope. I would. Yeah, be, man. man. So that um, that mic that I see you uh, just just a little bit of recording nerd. Please. Like I, I love recording myself and I'm learning more and more about it. So that's like the Audio Technica AT4040 or something like that. What no, is, this that is a Telefunken M82. Oh wow. Okay. And is that something that you put on most of your instruments? It's like a I use it a lot for Pandero. Like I, that's really the reason I got it. It's one of the microphones that Susano recommended. Okay. I think it's it's intended to be like a broadcast mic, like what we're using for. I think the the closest analog is like the SM7 or something like that, you know? Yeah. Um, but like I, I, I use it for a bunch of different things, you know, um, 
I, I record here at the house. I just did um, this year a recording for a group called Anamoya, which is a Miami-based group that I play with. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a, a trio of bass, guitar, drums, and then I added some percussion on top of it. And, like, it's the stuff that I do in those things. It's, like, it's adding soundscapes. It's adding, you know, a lot of out-of-the-box recording and affecting things and all that sort of stuff. So I, I have, like, a handful of different mics that I that I use here and tricks and toys that I do at home as well too. That's, that's been a big part, especially the last year, obviously. But yeah. Yeah. I think that a that. lot of people are getting their gear, gear game. Yeah, of course, man. For sure. But, that's where uh, all those I, stimulus checks. I have went, a baby. recommendation to for you and every percussionist. Um, Please. The mics that I use to record almost everything, everything, everything wow. is this one I have right here in front of me that I'm speaking into is a Sennheiser. E840, which is technically a vocal mic. However, mm -hmm. I've done side-by-side -side comparisons with SM57s, uh, other like condenser type of mics on percussion because I record percussion a lot. And so, right. um, and there is quite, there's nothing quite like the bass frequency punch that you can get with this particular mic. Okay. E what? What it's was the, a, what was the number? It's, so it, it's a Sennheiser, basically similar to an SM58 would, but mm -hmm. it's a it's an E840. Nice. It's like E40, but eight of them. Yeah. <laughs> or like nice. E8 himself. Anyway, but um, sweet, 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 sweet. So before you know, that, um, we we've talked for a long time now about your work. With PRD Mish, and I do want to talk about Groove Art and uh, sure. the other things that you're involved with, like Miami Bloco and and. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's talk about Groove Art a little bit. This is, is a it really rad Groove program. Art or is it Groove that, Archie? Groove or, Archie. Sorry. That's the well, Brazilian, you know, pronunciation of yeah. it. Yeah. Well, but we picked something that was supposed to be easy to read in English as well, too. And so, like, I have no, I, I kind of say groove art to people here in English, you know, like sure. it's okay. groove art with an e at the end. So, like, the Portuguese pronunciation is correct, but that's that's we chose it that way so that you could just say it, you know, because PRD Mice get people to say that correctly. <laughs> I've been trying for years. Yeah. And stuff. You guys are doing a great job, but like that, you know, the Brazilian Portuguese pronunciation is something different. So, for for groove art, we tried to pick something that was kind of like in the middle, in between. Yeah. But this is um, uh, a program essentially that you put together that y people can go <laughs> online now to to learn the techniques and the history and and um, of the Pandero, you know, just yeah, yeah. Of the Pandero b from you and Bernardo, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's 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 essential. It's a Pandero centric like method. You know, like when, yes. when we we started making this thing. I don't know, 2014, 13, 15, somewhere around there. Like it, it, we've been like working on it for a while. And the reason it took that long is, um, you know, A, because we had no funding for it. It was just like I would go down there when I could, pay a ticket to go down there. We record as much as we can. We'd have to like, we edit the stuff ourselves. Like I, I know too much Final Cut and not enough Final Cut, you know? like Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, so we did it like by ourselves really for the most part. But, oh, wow. Um, it's like seven and a half hours of this material, you know, of all of these different styles that can be done on the Pandero. And like the basic <clears> idea <throat> is that, you know, we teach you in the first like 10 lessons or so, like the basics of the Pandero, the next 10 lessons or so are about like some beginning patterns and things that you can do to work on, you know, technique and be able to start playing grooves at the same time. And then the last half or more, I guess, really of it is just adaptations of different grooves most of them from within Brazil, but some internationalist groups as well too. And so I think this thing is is a great tool for like for learning Pandero because it's just a wealth of information for you to go through. Yeah. Um, and we have everything played at three different speeds. We have multi camera so that you can really see what's going on. Oh wow! But one of the biggest things I think about that that's that's really um, an advantage to studying with this method is it comes with also like a list of all these links to these different styles of Brazilian music that you're playing. So oh, like, that, like examples? when you're learning, a, for example, when you're learning about um, uh, Fojo or Coco or any style like from Northeastern Brazil, like in the beginning of the lesson, Bernardo talks a little bit about what that style is and where it comes from. 
then goes to the pattern, shows you how to do it. And then we also have like a repository of like, you know, three or four links that you can go and check out the traditional version of the style. Because what we're mostly doing is adapting traditional rhythms to the pandero. Right. Okay. Like, almost none of what we're doing is traditional. These are all like using the modern pandero technique developed by Susano and other guys yep. to play all these other styles so that you learn a lot about the the history of Brazilian music and the the shape and scope of Brazilian music by doing this method as well too you know yeah and you call the method Pandero Moder Moderno right for that Pandero reason Moderno. right like it's yeah. it's it's not just traditional only it's like everything else is modern Pandero right that's yeah. that's the idea like playing Pandero in a modern style and like groove art is the is the overarching like brand behind this and company behind this okay meaning that we're planning to do more of these you know like we have one for pandero but like we want to do them for other instruments for jimbao for oh Hikiki, you know? cool i see dope. i see you know very cool dope. that's awesome exactly yeah. it's degree and like i think it's a thing that like all musicians need to have in their bag nowadays is this online teaching stuff in some form or fashion can be so useful for you whether you're not you're doing private lessons yourself whether or not you're doing you know, like we'll do clinics for universities. This last year I did a bunch of these where it was like Zoom clinics for universities around the place, you know. Oh, wow. Um, we That's did, cool. We put together a little documentary on Brazilian music, Bernardo and I, to do some group clinics and stuff as well too. That's cool. And like these types of things is online stuff. Like once you make something like that, then it's made and you can continue to like share this with people for the for the rest of your life you know like yeah this is a thing that like all my students that i work with now like i can you know say all right this is something you should pick up because you know this has like just a wealth of information of it that you can study from for you know five ten years really if you yeah want to deep into it, it, because it looks so really big. deep like i was starting uh to dig in just a little bit and just see what is offered in there and it looks like really comprehensive really well laid out and like a lot of fun honestly thank like, you man yeah like yeah I, I encourage people to check that out it's it, there's there's so many different ones now like this past like 10 or this past year or two there's been an explosion of online teaching and online methods and that sort of stuff sure yeah and a lot of them are like focused on like all right uh you want to play pandero here i'll get you up and running now you know like you too can play pandero yeah. and this method isn't really that it's it, it it's more that like pandero is a lot of work and it's going to take you time to do it and like right and yeah. like it's a very realistic approach to it to the yeah. instrument i think you know play t play pandero well, yeah, I mean, in 10 minutes yeah it's that's, that's not <laughs> happening dude no it's not happening. no no actually <laughs> no. no it's uh, I, yeah i recommend like watching Watching the videos we've been talking, the PRD Mice, uh, Rittenhouse videos, and then going to that site because you can like see totally how deep the musicianship is, like with you and Bernardo, and then you can start to see like all the <laughs> curriculum and everything laid out in the method, and it's going to make a lot of sense. You know what I mean? So, and that's spelled G R O O V E A R T E dot com. Yeah, yeah. Just so that, and. And that's really cool. I didn't realize that that was going to be like an overarching we'll, uh, brand. We'll put links. We'll put links to or... this stuff in the show description, of course. So, thank you, Bob. Thank you. Uh, yeah, man. Yeah, dude. There's really so much more to talk about. <laughs> dude, I we we yeah, could do another like two hours. What do you got? No, so do? I okay. I have a question at least. Um, okay. Hold on. Let me just look at this. I have a couple of questions. So. I sent you guys one. Stuff. I'm sorry. Obviously, I'm particular. I have some particular investment here in the Shekere. The Shekere <laughs> in Brazil yeah. has a yeah. fascinating playing technique to me. And I don't see okay. very much of it, at least. Like, it's not super common. It's around. But, like, like for example, mm -hmm. it was in that Bongar. Bongar? What is it? Bonga. What is it? Bonga. Bonga. That video had some well, pretty not. dope Shekere playing, but um, yeah. I, I guess maybe you could just illuminate for me, like what is the what is the presence of the Shekere in the different regional styles and how it how it fits into the popular culture in this. Sure. Mm. So I think where mm. you find that instrument in Brazil is always aligned with the same places that you found it through the Afro Cuban music. It's a, it's aligned with the stuff that is closer to the African origin. You know. Yeah. Do they call it? There's do they call it shekere? Like, there's different terms. There's shekere. They, uh, you hear that a lot for sure. 
but you also hear agbe. Oh, so the same in Brazil? The, okay, got it. Oh, yeah. really? Is that uh, is that in, in Spanish as well too? In uh, Cuba? Yes, Chekre. I don't remember all of the terms, to be honest with you. Um, but There's agbe is ones, the right? lowest one. Is like, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Nice. That, and that I think is just term for shikari in, in, in the Northeast. So like in the styles that you will see it mostly, uh, it's Bongar is one group. That's a group from Pernambuco and they play a, uh, a style called Coco, Coco de Shamba. Shamba is the region that they're from. Okay. Mm. And in that one, it's, uh, they, they all grew up together in a tejero which is like a, um, you know, that's, that's the, the religious gathering place for candomblé. Okay, gotcha. You know, so their music, even though it's not religious in a sense, like you're not going to church when you see them, it's informed by the, the religion, religious tradition for sure. Well, yeah, that's... So I'm... Sorry, go ahead, Mark. Just real quick, can you just explain to me what candomblé is? I, I don't know. That's just totally fine. Candomblé is like, I think the easiest analog is it's like, it's the Brazilian variant of, of Santeria. Okay. It's the, it's a Brazilian variant of, of a Yoruban musical tradition. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and and I guess I, I should, I should be very clear, not just Yoruban because in Brazil, there's a different mix of, of slaves that were brought over. I think you have mm. more uh, tribes from like the Bantu region and that sort of stuff that explain why the music does sound different between those two countries. Aside from just the like Portuguese versus Spanish thing, there is the different peoples from Africa that came over that all came from different traditions and then were just thrown together in this one spot. And it kind of reemerged as candomblé. So like within candomblé, you have candomblé keto, which is one style that's more aligned with the Yoruban tradition and closer, okay. I think, to some of the stuff that you'd be familiar with, Bob. But then there's candomblé Angola, which is more aligned with the Bantu tra tradition. Yeah. They they JJ, have the, all this stuff one. in Cuba as well. Just to be clear, yeah. Oh really? It's okay. it's in fact it's almost it, the same like really? parallels. Interesting. Like and what there was a, there's a third one right? Do you know the name of the third one? Yeah, I think it's JJ. JJ. Yeah, so that. Yep. Like uh, the Bantu is like Palo Congo. JJ is Arara, mm -hmm. and then what's Kondo? What's the first one? Kondoble Keto Ketu. Uh, Ketu. Yeah, Ketu, Ketu. is yeah. Is Lokumi Yoruba really stuff? I, that's my understanding, at least. I mean, I learned this stuff, I guess, just from just from things that like Mike Spiro has told me and Robert Lopez. Yeah, mm -hmm. our good friend Robert Lopez is like really, really, really heavy in contemplate, <laughs> or like he's really yeah. studied a lot. Um, I don't think I've ever met this guy personally, but I've talked with him online a bunch of times because he went he went down there. Oh right? yeah, I connected yeah. him with you. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah he yeah, went yeah, down yeah. there on a Fulbright. Uh, Fulbright that was a right. disaster, yeah, yeah. though. Right. I hear. Yeah, it. yeah, uh, yeah. We're we're uh, hoping to speak with him and. Yeah. Uh, nice. You know that. Anyway, that was that was a situation, but we'll let him talk it. Down. It is fascinating but, though, uh, like how much like like he's. Like Robert, our friend Robert Lopez is like all Brazil all the time. And you, as far as I know, are all Brazil all the time. But your worlds don't, don't really touch that much. It's because Brazil yeah. is huge. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's getting back to what yeah. I said before. Like that that place is monstrously huge. And all these different like regions have their own traditions. And they're all just so deep and profound. And that is one of the things that I got about from from studying Brazilian music and like just getting out of the United States academic system a little bit is just getting a, an appreciation for how, um, how rich these traditions are, yeah, you know? Definitely. And like, I think we, we sometimes think like, and this is a complete exaggeration, but like, our, you know, classical music is like this big monolith because we have like all these academic institutions, you know, designed to keep this Perpetuate thing going it. and to feed yeah. it and, you know, we don't necessarily have that for these other styles of music. And so like, maybe it doesn't get like, we don't see it as having the same kind of history and complexity, but 100% mm -hmm. does. Yeah. And w within Brazil, there's all these different regions where like, yeah, Robert and I maybe don't overlap so much, but that's just in that one country. And if you go to Cuba, like you were just saying, it's the same thing there. There's this like crazy depth to that. And there's all these different regions and styles. Yeah. That. In <laughs> Colombia, it's the same thing there. In Venezuela, it's the same thing yeah. there. I think this is something that like 
we as, you know, quote unquote Americans, uh, don't like really appreciate all that much is like the wealth of culture around the United States, you know, the wealth of culture in the Caribbean, the wealth of culture in South America yeah. is yeah. like, like, I, I'm just going to say for me growing up in Texas, like we learned about Mexico because we took part of it. <laughs> and like, we didn't really learn about like anything beyond that, you know, like, yeah. like it was not enforced so much. And like, the more I get into the music within Brazil and even just ancillary, like excursions and other places, like I, I'm just, I find it so remarkable how deep and profound all of these traditions are and how you can, you can just go endlessly in one direction and like never hit bottom. Yeah. Yep. In any of these, you yeah. know? Yeah, and, man. So it gives me a, a, a lot, a lot greater respect for all of these different areas. And then going back to what we were talking about before about like, um, you know, how, how things in Cuba and Brazil, those different names for those, for those styles are so similar and based on the same thing. That's because they're based on this amazing, incredible tradition in Africa, yeah. which is, 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 you know, the, the font of all yeah. this sort of stuff, you know? Yep. And like how deep that goes is a whole other world and a whole other level, you know? Yeah. That's something that's so amazing about being a musician in this day and age, like that we, uh, that we can do these like, you know, podcasts and call each other from around the world and all this sort of stuff. Like, yeah that you can connect with these types of people from all over the place. I just picked up a guy the other day that I met on Reddit from Uganda. <laughs> wow. The Uganda musician named uh, Kenobe. Um, he's, he's inc- I saw him during the middle of, of the pandemic, just I was flipping through Reddit and he was live streaming and playing like Kora, but like really playing it. I was like, yeah, this is not what you normally see on Reddit. Usually it's like, <laughs> on the, playing, like top broadcasts or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Usually it's like yeah, somebody yeah. playing along to ACDC or something like this guy yeah, yeah. is like, something is happening here. And so I messaged him and I connected with him. And then he hit me up the other day. He said, I'm coming through Orlando. Can I get a ride? I went and picked up and I met Whoa. him. And then we started talking <laughs> about like African music and like how absurd it is to try and talk about African music as a yeah, whole. Af- because it's so deep the same way we would about Brazil, yeah. you know? Um, and like, and I just think it's so cool as a musician this day and age that we get to do that. Yes. Know? Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I agree. Bach didn't get that. Beethoven didn't get those things, you know? No. That, that's something unique to our experience that I think should be, I mean, it obviously celebrated. It's affected the way that music is made nowadays. But like, yeah, it's something I think we should, we should really, I don't know, be aware and, of. And this embrace, is crazy what we're you know, doing. I think it's a positive thing. And, Everything that you've been talking about with um, with classical music being academically institutionalized is, Mm -hmm. you know, there are a lot of conversations about that and how massively problematic that is considering the jobs that are not available for anyone going through those programs. Yeah. And then also just how much other music you are ignoring. Yeah. And, And hearing you talk about, like, Americans in general being unaware of the cultural... Well... To be fair to classical music, though, um, it it has a particular rigor that could only exist within that system. Like, it, mm-hmm. you can't pass the rigor of practicing scales and shit in a folkloric way, you know? That's interesting. But I wonder, like, how much of our conception of what classical music is is defined by the academic institutions that continue them nowadays. Yeah, perhaps, but... Um, what was it like to be a classical musician, you know, when it was really happening? No, no. How do you get to be able to be, ago? like, a person like Bach or Haydn? Like, those... Those those dudes just work jobs, you know? Like, he was, like, a, he was working at a church. He was working, you know, like... They're, they're, they're yeah. also kind of freaks of nature, though. Uh, 100%. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, I mean, so, yeah, Bach... Bach worked for a church and wrote constantly every day for God, like just <laughs> for God, just one hundred percent in love with him. <laughs> and then Haydn got that sick gig, I think, at like what is it, Esterhouse, where he that like he got like thirty casks of wine as part of his rider a month, and he had like an in-house orchestra, so he got not? to just like wow. write a million symphonies and like hang out and drink wine with his like with his musician friends, you know. But That's he was life. also like, I I love his music, not gonna lie, you know what I yeah. mean? I love Haydn, but yeah. But, um, yeah, 
So anyway, I, I love thinking about his life just in that time, like when he was in 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 his position at Esther Housie. Just little that, exactly. that bounces around in my mind sometimes. I'm like, to me, that's like that. That's real. I don't know for lack of a better term, classical music. You know, like that. That's where that stuff really comes from. And that was like. You know, that was of that era. His his life was of that era. His music reflected the life that he was living and the situation that he was in. Yeah. Yeah. And like that isn't necessarily the case with with modern classical music. Or or I should say like people who are playing music of that era nowadays, you know. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean that's that's an interesting thing to bring up, Bob, about the, the rigor of the practice. But I mean, what you both have been talking about so Bob, for years with me, what you've been talking about, like with learning um, Afro-Cuban music and what I'm hearing from you and, and listening from you, Brian, and listening to everybody else play, there's 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 just as much rigor in learning that music as well. And it's not scales and it's not no, necessarily I guess, reading. Okay. But My point is it isn't in the rigor, it's in the institution, right? Because you can't have an mm-hmm. orchestra without high levels of organization. Right. Okay. But you're going to have a samba school and that's highly organized as well too, but in a different way, you know, that's like four or 500 people playing. Yeah, that's true. Drums. Drums. You know? Yeah. (laughs) And there's no sheet music. (laughs) That's true. That's a good point. It's just a different method of doing it. Yeah. Good. They have multiple conductors. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. Drum majors all around. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't I don't wanna I don't want anyone to get it wrong about me. I mean, I love I love Beethoven. I love you know what I mean? Like I will yeah. listen to that stuff regularly. That's me personally. I don't want to speak for the Dude, podcast and like, or anyone I'm, else. So here, many of like, my experiences when I was a kid were going to orchestra concerts and like that yeah, sound yeah. is something that's amazing. I don't think there's anything like that can be taken away from like that the music for sure. I, I yeah. think the the problem is is more in the educational system. Okay. Yeah, here. Dude, dude. And how it just highlights certain areas as if they are the end all be all, you know? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I agree. And, and that if you are going to be a musician in the United States, your two options are classical or jazz. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for years and years and years, that was the only thing that you could major in. Yeah. Was classical yeah. or jazz. What if I'm playing a country band? Fuck you. <laughs> Sorry, on this podcast. I, I made yeah, you it so can far. you can say <laughs> you when you we know? were when we were talking about the tambourine duo, we both uh, oh, yeah, we said right. we, we said bad go. words. Yeah. We're good. We're good. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mom. You know, I think it's much more to do that. I, I, and it's more with the academic institutions and that style of learning. But at the same time, I wouldn't trade my experience at UM for anything. It led me to so many great things. Like I, you know. Yeah. yeah, there are things that we can change about that stuff, and things that that can grow out of it for sure. But like the institution itself, is is something worth uh, worth defending and working on. You know. Oh yeah. Make yeah, it better. Yeah. yeah, I mean that. That's a very large conversation. I'm and I'm I'm a little <laughs> intimidated by taking it on. It's something that I need to like think about and talk about more. You know what I mean? Before I'm. But it's it's worth it's worth taking on, and I think it needs to happen. You know, so. I think it it is happening now, just by the yeah. way people are learning music and being exposed to it, and the way people are like signing up with their own individual teachers and following YouTube channels and cha- taking their own the, courses. The pandemic life, really being... leveled the playing field on online teaching. Dude, it did. Yeah, because who's yeah? I was able did. to travel everywhere and keep a full studio. It's mm-hmm. amazing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It'll it'll be different, but I I have I'm convinced that uh, musical culture will persist no matter what happens. Oh yeah, so, yeah. There's there's no doubt yeah. about that. You know. Yeah. Um. Just want to say quick, you did in your what I listened to. I I know the Murdering Brothers. I have fun listening to them. I did that <laughs> yes. stuff. But uh, that Donny Hathaway live record. Oh yeah. You said that I will listen to this forever on repeat. Mm-hmm. That the the both the Rhodes playing and the piano playing in Jealous Guy. Yeah. I I transcribed all of that, <laughs> and it's like so deep. And that's something that yeah. I like have in my pocket for any time I go into studio session type work because it's just like, wow, it's perfect, <laughs> man. That track yeah. is so beautiful. That anyway, track, I just that track to, is amazing. That like, that whole album, yeah. Like I said, I'll listen to that on repeat forever. I think it's just the perfect encapsulation of that type of band. 
Yeah, you know? it's nasty, man. It's so good. Do they still have that, um, I don't, like, new age radio station in Miami? What's that? That radio station in Miami where they play, like, not new age. What am I thinking of? Like, like slow jams. Oh. Uh, Do they still have that? The Oasis. <laughs> the 105.1, the Oasis. They have that still? I think that's, and, and what, what was the name? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm remembering it now. At 11 o'clock every night, it was The Quiet Storm. With yeah, The Frank Quiet Goose. Storm. Quiet yeah. Storm, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I moved my mic. My bad. <laughs> nice mic technique. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> dude, you, you saying... You saying that new age radio? I, I didn't uh, just remind yeah. you brought me back to Devin for just a second there, man. Because like that's some stuff that you would throw out into the world, I think, <laughs> just for fun. But anyway, Devin. yeah, <laughs> we we previously interviewed Devin Smith. Nice, yeah. nice. That's amazing. That's amazing. That guy, <laughs> dude. I'm gonna get an honorary degree from UM by the end. You of are, August. man. You're gonna meet all these people from the like. UM I, circle? I've already played a lot with with a lot of cats but now i'm just learning everything about the program and you know <laughs> we contacted I'll, lika I'll... she's on nice yeah. yes that's awesome yeah. yeah um so all right is there anything else that you want to like shout out and, or or talk about or just point people towards or uh you know i i really appreciate again your time and you've been extremely generous and we've been able to take some deep dives into some cool stuff and i've learned a ton both researching for this and talking to you so if there's anything else that you would like to cover you know let well thank you man i mean no not really we we, we did enough here um i i think the one other project that i would that i would like to mention is is my group miami bloco oh yeah, yeah. that's super um, this is super cool man this is th yeah. this this group I'm, I'm very proud of man i'm very very proud of this group because it's it's really starting to, to flourish in a, in a way um, okay th this group is based upon so, I mean, it comes really out of the Brazilian ensemble stuff that we did with Ney, you know, and like he would always have those batucada tunes where we would just like march on stage together and play the calls back and forth and all that sort of stuff, you know. I yeah. learned that from him for sure. But um, then I started going down and working with Bernardo and Gabriel, and Gabriel in particular has a group called Batuki Batu, uh, which is a Rio de Janeiro style batucada group that he leads with a combination of like hand signals and calls like he's playing a giant like 808 or something like that you know dude that wait hand signals and drum calls yeah at the same exactly. time yeah that it, is that's bonkers man that's it's amazing. like you'll, you'll have all right so we're going we're gonna do a virada but it's virada number one you know oh i see i see and you know this and like and then like a certain like then sometimes it's like a, a drum call like for example whenever you're playing say that that conca that boom, ba, that always ends every samba right like that's the hippie call that stops okay it. You know, huh. and the one that starts is right. there's like certain drum calls that like are in the vocabulary that trigger certain events. And so, yeah. but like the way he does it is, is it's not like I, I, the thing that I always run into in Miami, especially and, and all over the place in the U S is that people think we're a drum circle <laughs> because uh, we have drums uh, yeah. and sometimes we play in a circle. And and you guys know that that's a very different thing, you know. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Bob, I don't know if you ever went to any of the, like the full moon like drum circles in Miami, like on the beach and that sort of stuff. Uh, like, sure didn't, sure didn't. Eh, me neither. <laughs> I haven't been to any of them. But like, there's a big culture for that here, and it's you know it can kind of be reduced to like a bunch of dudes showing up with their djembes they bought at Guitar Center and yeah, yeah. like shredding out. However, it's not always that. And I think a lot of those people who are doing that sort of stuff, like uh, so many of them are genuinely interested in music and so many of them are interested in particular traditions, but they're not gluing it together necessarily in the best way. And in sure this style, aren't. it's like we are very much playing a particular style of, of drumming. And so there are kind of like roles for everybody within the group. Uh -huh. And in order for the whole thing to make sense, you have to follow one person's directions. And then with that, we can like make performances out of it where rather than just like sitting in a groove and soloing over it, it's like moving between sections and I'm queuing dynamics and I'm queuing different things with, you know, with playing, with hand signals and all but that sort of stuff. You're, right? Yeah. Um, you do incorporate like other rhythms. Like I'm just looking at your blurb that you wrote about this, like right. Plana, North Mississippi, Fife and Drum, Miami mm -hmm. Bass. 
Mm-hmm. What's mm-hmm. Go-Go? I don't even know what that is. Go-Go? That's like DC stuff, you know? I, I don't know. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> Sardines. <laughs> and pork and beans. Oh. You know what? Man, <laughs> call Richard Hargett after this, and he's going to tear your ear off for not knowing about Go-Go. Okay. It's like it's a DC <laughs> style of music that's like this, like, slow funk groove with a man groove is it like uh, what's that guy's name bernard purdy bernard purdy i don't know that he came out of that style but i don't think it's that far off i think you remember like there are some jill scott tunes that feature this stuff there are some roots tunes that feature this stuff. okay tank of the bangers i think has some tunes that feature this stuff but it's basically it's like a slow drum set groove filled in with like congas and timbales okay but they're not playing like cuban patterns or anything like that they're playing you know the go-go patterns i don't i don't have a better term for oh. it now, there, there's a there's an instagram account that i'm addicted to called chase boogie espn of go-go <laughs> okay and like he just all like, right <laughs> he's just like a super fan like filming all these go-go bands in dc and the conga setup is crazy because they use two like congas, normal congas, and then they use two of those like little junior congas. Have you seen those, Bob? Junior congas? They're like, yeah, they're like congas that are like maybe only like this deep. Oh yeah, I've uh, seen those. They're tiny little ones. They're like eight, nine inch drums, eight, ten inch drums, something like that. You know? They're they're smaller than a quinto, and then they're like vertically smaller than a quinto as well too. And they set them up in a row of four, and there's like a different style of playing that goes with it that this is really anyway, like i've i really don't know what you're talking about i'm gonna have to look <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll send you some stuff yeah, I'll i'm send gonna you this check Instagram out that account. account for sure yeah, but yeah. point being you you incorporate all of these aspects styles, and all these right. different grooves in the miami bloco and uh and this is all being called by by drum and by hand signals and so yeah for you know that that sounds crazy but at the same time, Bob and I both have participated, sorry, participated deeply in a group that was mainly led by conduction and hand signals, but the leader was not playing extremely oh, complex really? music at the same time, you know? Uh, so I can, okay. I can contextualize it in that way, but that's really, that's really fascinating. That's cool. It's a fun group. And like, and the reason we play all those different styles is like uh, the logic that we follow is always based on the Samba schools and, and that, and the instrumentation is based on the Samba schools as well. Too. Yeah. But like that's what that's what they do down there with with that group is they take it away from the traditional samba stuff and incorporate other rhythms from around Brazil and around the world, and so our version of it here has to kind of reflect Miami a little bit more, you know, and reflect the U.S. a little bit more and like the stuff that we know. So like Miami bass, like I, like I just like transcribe some like two live crew. <laughs> like grooves uh, like from the 808s okay. and stuff like that and like mapped them out for like our samba section and like took some breaks from those things and like we have a whole little miami based arrangement oh, nice. because it's from it we're you know we're from miami and that's but it's also has a tie to brazilian music because all that baile funky stuff that we talked about earlier baile non goma yeah. yeah all that stuff is heavily influenced by miami bass and like two live crew and like <laughs> volt mix and things that came out of it's like a big circle the early 90s late 80s exactly exactly <laughs> wow back okay so it fits with Crazy. that group in a really good way you know and so and so the reason i'm really proud of miami bloco is because like you know it's something i've been doing for the past four or five years yeah but up until like recently well maybe in the last year i'd say up until recently i had just been doing these as like hangs once a week like i never made anything official out of it i didn't charge people for any classes or anything like that it was just like i have these drums let's play them yeah (laughs) Yeah. i want to do something like that here honestly that's the thing man when you have the drums like you have to get them out and play and and like when you when you do something like that like i did for years with them it just engendered this community around it because people started getting involved and what i love about miami walker right now is it's a really beautiful mix of Dudes I play with in the scene in Miami here, you know, like my my star sordo player is a bass player in a group that I play with, you know, like he's just slid over to the drum. And like mm. and I, I have all these musicians, these high level incredible musicians like working in this group and playing with me. And then we have people who have like never played instruments before and have, have jumped into this group, but they all find a role, find a space because all the <laughs> instruments have their own different techniques, have their own kind of like things that you could do to them, you know, like, so like it's a beautiful, like, mix of people that i think breaks down the barriers between professional musicians and amateur musicians which i think is something that we have here in the u.s 
we have a problem we with have that. Barrier. We have this weird yeah. line. Yeah. You, know? you probably encountered this with your stuff with Cuba, yep. right? You know, like people just play music. That's just what people do. <laughs> yeah. You know? Huh. Yeah. I'm, and I we have this weird this. line here where it's like, if you're, if you're getting a check for it, then you're a professional musician. It's a different thing. But like, I'm a hum, you know, speaking from a human perspective, I don't think it really is that way. Yeah. You know? And like in this group, I have people who are like, yeah, professional musicians and all that sort of stuff, enjoying playing with these people who are not, you know, like that I think is a really cool thing. Yeah, that's super hip. The spirit of that I think is more important than anything else that we do, you know? Yeah. And, and allows people to kind of like break down these walls between professional musicians and amateur musicians and like, no, we just get together and we just play, you know? Oh, uh, that's sweet. Yeah, and yet, <clears throat> so... People can check that out on on the grams at, at Miami Blocko. Yep. And uh, are there any other places that you would want to send people to check out that group and what you're doing with that? Uh, for for Miami Blocko, no. I mean, check, stay tuned. Maybe by the time this comes out, the website will be up and running. Oh, dude, you let know? us know. We'll definitely put that perfect in the the notes for Excellent. sure. Okay, cool. I'll include that and. Uh, and and just you know, if anybody's in town in Miami, just anybody, just hit us up anybody on Instagram at all? and you come play. Oh, for the Miami Blocko, <laughs> for Miami Blocko, hit up Brian um, Potts, y'all. Yes, yeah, it's, <laughs> at, at, some, at some point, I'm... just everyone hit up Brian anybody Potts. Up, anybody come, everybody hit me up. The mayor. Of if Miami. you ever in town, just, I don't even live no, there anymore. I'm at the some mayor. point, I'm going to go down and see Geneva, and I, I I would love to check that oh, out. That, that seems like a really fun hang. Yeah, she's been doing the past couple of rehearsals with us. We've been doing oh, some stuff. Oh, wow, with, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, we've been doing some stuff at this great place, Electric Air Studios. We're going to be doing some live streams from there pretty soon. So. Oh, sweet. Well, I'll okay. give you all that information for sure. Cool. Nice. Right on, man. Cool beans. Well, thank you so, so much for talking to us. I, I This was this was amazing. I really man. appreciate your time. Yeah, man. Thank you all. This was a, this was a super pleasure to get to... to to re meet you apparently. I know. <laughs> Since we did that game together, Mark. I'm sorry, I don't I gotta I gotta go back and Likewise, to we, watch this video that Bob has up apparently. We both failed that test miserably. But yeah, it'll yeah. never happen again because we'll for sure remember this. And yeah. I super appreciate getting to meet you and talk with you and, and Bob for inviting me onto this sort of thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. My brother from another mother, man. I met Bob Ledoux on like the first day of school. Like <laughs> Yes. We've I love known that, each other man. since that's then. That's awesome. First day, guys. So that that's a real thing. <laughs> so cool. So so cool. Right on. Well, I'll take us out on a, a track. Should I play Tama Jam or Hop Sixty Three? Uh, Tama Jam. All right. Tama Jam Baru. That's the hit. All right. All right. That one. <laughs>